Good morning, everyone. Um, on behalf of the board of TBNSW, I'd like to welcome you all here today for what I'm sure will be a very interesting day. Um, TBNSW effectively is in the business of the promotion and development of thoroughbred breeding within New South Wales. Um, as part of that, we have representation on the board of Rykeek, which is the Racing Industry Consultation Group. We also are members of the board of TBA um, and are also involved in various other discussions and communications with both state veterinary departments, state officials, or any other industry matter that may arise from time to time. Um, in most recent years, one area where TBNSW has become quite involved is the area of education. As everyone in the room would be aware, um, finding and sourcing good and new people into our industry has been an ever-growing and increasing problem. Um, and as part of that, we sought to develop various pathways to bring new people into the industry and to develop those who are already within the industry with further education and development that can only benefit us all. Um, none of this would have been possible without our sponsors um, who help to fund all this education that goes on. And for that, we'd like to thank Tom, who's come on board with TBNSW this year um, as one of our key sponsors, in addition to five or six other sponsors that we have as well. Um, I think that brings us to the area then of innovation as well, which has become a key topic for our industry recently. Um, we've seen on the racing side with the Everest, the benefits that innovation can bring in one form, bringing a huge new demographic to our industry and also helping to promote the benefits and positive stories that we can tell about racing. Similarly, on the breeding side, we've seen with Tom's app, the benefit that innovation can bring, um, trying to reduce some of the burdensome paper systems that we've had historically, to see new ways of looking at things, um, how we can introduce the iPad into our offices as well. Um, it, there's a huge amount to be gained from all of us, from all aspects of it, from the small stud farms, through to the owner breeder, to the adjustment farm, etc. And I think today's forum will help to highlight many more areas where systems like Tom can be of benefit to us and how we can broaden and introduce them into our system uh, and into our businesses as well. So I think without further ado, this is probably a good point for me to shut up and hand over to Tom. And I just hope it's the first of many events that partners like Breeder and, and the other partners can do for the, uh, for the membership of the Thoroughbred Breeders in New South Wales. So for those that don't know, my name is uh, Tom Seymour. I'm the founder of Breeder. I've been around thoroughbreds all my life and are very fortunate to call this industry home. Um, and by no means am I a tech nerd. I've never written a single piece of code in my life, but I love to discover easier ways to do things. And my innovation mantra is very simple. It's the ability to achieve two or more outcomes from the one action. So if we remember that throughout the day. Um, I pivoted towards the innovation space of the industry three or four years ago, and I've been living and breathing it ever since. Uh, even though that I've experienced all the standard highs and lows of the creation of a startup, um, there hasn't been a day where I haven't woken up passionate about what I'm doing or a day where I haven't learnt something new. Um, people started out by asking, why are you doing something like what we're doing here today? Um, and I questioned myself many times, but I just felt I got to a point where, bugger that, I really need to try and achieve three things that are burning inside me. And the first one of those is really to bring awareness to the great people that are working in this space and the great products that are actually already out there that I wasn't even aware of. So I think it's really important to give a platform like today to recognise and hear from those people because if I didn't know about it, I'm pretty sure that you guys didn't know about it. And there's some really talented people. And the most amazing thing is we're all working towards one goal and that's to benefit the breeding community. So there isn't a lot of financial, it's not all commercially spiked, it's all about trying to bring tools and efficiencies into what you do into your day-to-day -day business. So that was number one. And number two, it was glaringly obvious that we need to change the, um, the narrative around innovation. The thoroughbred breeding and racing industry, for that sake, um, is evolving at a dangerously slow rate when compared to other, most other comparable industries. We desperately need to modernise and a great example of that is look at the impact of what English Digital have had um, in our industry over the last couple of years. And if you go back before that, the scepticism that flowed on to 
what is this platform? How are we going to use it? It's going to interfere with our traditional pra practices. I don't think there would be a breeder out there today that doesn't acknowledge English Digital as a key component of their business. And I can't say Nick, but like Nick and his team have done an enormous amount of heavy lifting in this industry to make people aware of the tools and the efficiencies and the benefits of digital done well. Um, and then the other point to that about the narrative is, you'll hear today why standing still is just not going to be sufficient or sustainable. So just think about that. We can't just do what we're doing today. We have to make change. And we need to create environments, really importantly, that the next generation want to come and work and they want to grow into. Because it doesn't matter what we're doing on the science front and all these tremendous things about prize money and all the momentum that we're going to be going forward, the reality is if we can't get the people coming up in these silos to come and work in the industry, it's pretty much all for nothing. And the third point is that I think we really need to amplify the need for innovation to get a seat at the table. So you'll hear from a pretty amazing group of speakers today doing amazing things, put into context that not one of them have had an ounce of funding from the industry, not one of them have had any support from the industry. That's not saying the people in the room, that's from a governance perspective. They've done it all themselves. And if we look at that comparative to other industries, there is programs, there's funding, there's grants for these people to get off the ground. Now we need to create opportunities for not just the people that are here and the breeder the like. I'm thinking about the breeders of lrbreeder.horse that want to come into the industry in the next five years to try and do the same thing. Because you'll learn today there's more innovation coming and there's more smart people and there's more young people and we need to give them the hooks that makes them want to come into the breeding industry rather than other you know, agricultural industries that are doing far more than ourselves. We also need, as part of that, the reason why I'm very, I believe strongly that um, innovation needs that seat at the table is that we need to give those that are in the game at the moment the confidence that we can change the data systems. We can have the confidence that these guys can go and invest further into that technology because all that's going to do is actually improve and address all the issues that we have um, within the industry. Now, for most industries, the biggest difficulty they have is agreeing on it, what those issues are and then finding the funding to actually address them. Now, we've got a massive, I won't say a head start, but we've got a paper that was written two years ago endorsed by the entire industry, even Gay Waterhouse's dog, has got a photo up on the website. A TWR report. We know what the issues are. We have an amazing amount of smart people working on smart programs that can address and wipe out those issues pretty quickly and cost efficiently. We just have to get momentum <coughs> into say, right, oh, here's the tools we've got. Let's start using them to knock off welfare issues, to knock off those things that are really going to affect our social licence from breeding and racing. So they're the three drivers for me why this had to be done. And I know that's a little bit controversial. Some may consider a little bit critical. But I'm also empathetic, sympathetic to the breeding community of why that appetite for change has been slow. And I'll use three examples. Broadband. Um, and you'll speak to Matt Comerford, what he has to go through to run a, you know, a tri-state operation the size of Whitton with the broadband capacity it has, I just, you know, poor bug. You know, that, that is everyone's uh, a roadblock for all, and I'm very sympathetic to that. There's also, you know, we use the stud book and the Racing Australia sites, my horse racing, my racing dot horse, and, you know, to be honest, if there are two signature platforms that new breeders coming into the industry, if that's their first time experience in using those two platforms, we've got a lot to be said for how we're treating our new people and how we're attracting, you know, first time breeders into the industry. And then the third part of that is previous rollouts. And I'll use, and this is not in picking on anyone individually, 
Racing Australia has had its own issues. We're all, you know, we're all aware of the different PRA struggles, etc. So it's no one's fault. But the rollouts of something like a national program of um, welfare and traceability was very clunky, wasn't seamless, and wasn't easy for the end user, the people here in the room, to really understand and get behind it. Now, if that's clunky and not an easy experience for you, the take-up is poor. People don't see the end results quickly and encourage others to get behind it. And then when something else comes along, there isn't that attitude, oh, that welfare and traceability thing that came out two years ago that we're now doing as part of our day-to-day, -day, I can see the massive impact that's having across the board and we're making massive inroads as an industry to address those issues. Something new comes out, they're going, okay, well, I can, I'll have a look at this and I'll do it. But at the moment, things have been done in a pretty poor, or the user experience has basically been rubbish, so our take up has been poor. So I think we need to draw a line in the sand and say, right, how do we utilise all the resources we've got in the room to improve those experiences for the breeder? And so today I want to start from a new screen. Today I hope we can start with a positive narrative around change, wipe, close the door on, on the past. And today I hope you will recognise that without innovation, the sustainability of our industry is a genuine risk. I hope today also we can fill you with provoking ideas, thought-provoking ideas, to empower you with the knowledge to broaden the think tanks and prepare you for what's ahead. I'd love to think that after listening to our incredible speakers today, everyone here in the room will leave with an appetite to look for their own ways to find two or more outcomes for the one action. And um, on capping that, but I'm very grateful for everyone's um, taking the first step. I know that sounds like an AA class, but you're here today and we're going to feed you with the information that hopefully you can take out there and just start that momentum. Um, I just wanted to really, we'll tap into what we're going to cover today uh, is AI, and then we're going to roll into data, some new technology, a bit about what's happening on the research and industry funding, a little bit of Q&A, and then also a bit of an innovation workshop. Um, I'm not quite sure what Jamie's slide is going to throw at me next. Um, Jamie, what have we got next? Artificial intelligence. We're using language today that might be foreign to some. It's all about getting a broader understanding. We're going to try and not, it's disrespectful to say dumb down, but just to make it um, as easy and understanding as we can. Um, now, that is my side done, so thank you for that. And I'm now going to throw over, well, first of all, an introduction, though, that after talking about innovation, um, there's no greater innovation company in the world than Google, and there's no greater uh, innovative product mm -hmm. influencing society than AI. And today we're lucky enough to have someone who actually understands both. Um, I'm about to introduce you to Neil French. Neil French is the director at Google. He's also a great mate of mine. And I'm very grateful because Neil's just got off a plane from India um, to make it up here today. Neil's uh, knowledge of the equine thoroughbred breeding racing industry is nada, but I think that's really refreshing because we'll be able to ask questions, but it, Neil wouldn't know one end of the horse to the other. But it's not about, and it's a great sort of example of we can't just focus on purely those with the equine background. We have to broaden our horizons. We have to be more appealing to those that are speaking the languages of the Neil French and the next Google guys. Neil's also one of those fascinating people who goes to Silicon Valley to the Google conference every year that talks about what's happening in Google in the next five to 10 years. So this conversation about AI, I was having a conversation with Neil six years ago and I remember going, can't be like, you're kidding me, it's not going to get to that. And blow me dead, here we are, five years almost to the day, and he's going to get up and present it to you. So this stuff is real. Um, and there's no better person and better fella to present it to. I'd like to introduce you to Neil French. I am not Morgan Freeman, and what you see is not real. Well... At least in contemporary terms, it is not. 
What if I were to tell you that I'm not even a human being? Would you believe me? What is your perception of reality? Is it the ability to capture, process, and make sense of the information our senses receive? If you can see, hear, taste, or smell something, does that make it real? Or is it simply the ability to feel? I would like to welcome you to the era of synthetic reality. Now, what do you see? Now that probably evoked many emotions. Some thought it would be pretty cool. So that was completely generated by AI. So that was not Morgan Freeman. That was uh, not Morgan Freeman's voice, all created by AI. And I think sometimes that perception of AI is that it's sci-fi and it's interesting, but it's not potentially useful for my particular business. But I really want to take it down a level and kind of demystify, demystify AI, AI and really give you an understanding how every single business in some form has the opportunity to utilize AI and also give you a little window into AI is being used everywhere today, but I want to really, my goal is that when you go home tonight, you'll be able to explain to your wife or daughter with some sort of credibility as to what AI actually is. And I tested this last night at my 77 year old dad, and he said, I can now explain what AI is. So the bar is with my dad, he was happy with it. So I really hope that that go the next 20 or so minutes. But this is our CEO, Sundar Pashai. And for him to make a statement like this is pretty profound. He believes that the impact of AI on all of us will be compared to electricity and fire. I mean, just think about that. That's a huge statement. And he wouldn't have made that statement even two or three years ago. There's been enormous advancements in the ability to democratize AI. And what that means is that for many years, it was really only used by one or two or three large tech companies, the Googles of the world, the Amazons of the world. It was something that people wouldn't even dream of understanding how to use or wouldn't have the resources to use. But I'll really start to explain to you why that has changed dramatically. And the simplicity and the cost and the accessibility is now on the cusp that I'm very confident in the next one, two, three years, you will all actually be utilizing AI in some form. Interestingly, it was only a few hundred years ago that nobody read, could read or write. It was just for the high priests that got access to reading and writing. There was no requirement. And think how that's fundamentally impacted society. It's just assumed now. And certainly, many of the futurists and technologists and are saying that it will have the same impact from an AI perspective that in many years from now, we'll look back at even me sitting up here and discussing why or when it should be used. In the future, there'll be two kinds of people. They'll be told what to do by robots and those that will tell robots what to do. And I kind of, I say that in jest, but what I mean by that is, and I know there's lots of propaganda and there's lots of fear sometimes about the unknown, but think of AI as a, as a clay. You can be able to shape that depending on what business that you're in. You, you know human beings will control and decide how it can really drive and benefit your particular organization and really want to make sure that you're a part of the latter category. So what is AI? And ultimately, I want to give you some real examples of where it's being used in traditional industries where perhaps you hadn't actually connected. Ah, that's, 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 that's AI and that's how it's driving business value. It's helping increase profitability. It's helping improve customer experience, all the really important things. Now, AI is actually not new. It may feel totally novel and mysterious, but actually it was first used over 70 years ago. This is a guy called Alan Turing. Um, it was part of the Allies' Second World War. It was first used to help code breaking. And he was a legendary mathematician and computer scientist. So it was used 70 years ago. I first joined IBM back in London about 20 years ago. And 
This was the thing they were very proud of, that finally IBM's Deep Blue managed to beat the world chess champion. Uh, it was a huge pivotal moment that a computer actually beat a human brain. Now, AI would beat a chess champion in less than a millisecond. It's not even a competition anymore, but again, there was just fleeting moments that AI was being utilized because it was so expensive. I can't even imagine the cost of what it would have to put the AI computer in front of Gary Kasparov. But now, with ChatGBT, which we'll get to, you could be any chess champion in seconds within, with, by, by um, just by, the, by your fingertips and your mobile phone. So really exciting. And I think um, the key shift that's really reinvigorated AI and, and given it to you know, the general population is that there's something called generative AI. Just quick show of hands, who's heard of ChatGBT? Wow, excellent. Who has used ChatGBT? Amazing. Okay, probably hand this to some of you guys. Um, there's actually two types of AI that I want to unpack. There's one called analytical AI, and that is the form of analyzing huge data sets and really finding patterns. So if you think about Uber Eats, it can start to predict how long it will take to arrive. Um, now, generative AI, which is the big change, on the other hand, is it's taking that analytical AI, but it's actually starting to generate useful insights. And that's the key piece that means it gets access to lots of organizations can utilize. It's all very well having AI to extract all that data, but actually then you need more computer scientists to start to generate those insights and start for it to be useful. Now with generative AI, for those of you that chat GBT, you ask it a question and all in the background and then ultimately like a human being, it can start to use personality and sentiment and it can start to give you useful answers. And, and that, is the real game changer. ChatGBT was only launched, I think, end of November, December, so it's only been six months. And I'll go through some of the amazing stats. So it's really important to understand generative AI is capable of creating text, code, images, speech. Who uses Alexa? Who uses Google Assistant for voice commands at home? That's still starting to use generative AI. Now this is my attempt to start to demystify the magic. Really what's driving this is computing power. It's, look at that stat. Every time I read it, I find it hard. This is Google's latest physical quantum computer to the left-hand side. Quantum computing can complete 47 years of computing tasks, 47 years of computing tasks in just six seconds. Quantum computing is innovating so quickly that it's 241 million times faster. This is the bit that my dad said, I don't believe it. I said, look, uh, than the one released in 2019. So really what's driving AI and generative AI, it's not magic. It's that if you think about your iPhone and where it came only five or 10 years ago, it's processors, it's large data centers. Google has 29 data centers, probably the size of Scon, all, all across Scon, all across the world containing not necessarily quantum computing, but computers that have that capability and are moving so quickly. And I'll, you'll get an understanding of what that means in a second. So number one is computing power is advancing at an unbelievable pace of innovation. And two, the amount of data that's been generated by all of us as we move to be digital, it's the data that feeds the computers that starts to drive these amazing insights and that's where the magic is created. I haven't had a squeegee yet, that's fantastic. All right. So let's unpack it. Analytical AI, as I mentioned before, analyzing huge data sets. Whenever you think about huge data sets, think about 47 years computing tasks in six seconds. It doesn't get tired, it doesn't have a sick day. It's constantly analyzing and starting to try and create patterns. Now, this is the only two words I'm going to use that maybe are a little bit technical, but it's not necessarily technical because if you think about our brains, I've got a two-year-old son, he starts off coming into this world, his brain or his neural networks are zero. I explain to him what is a cat and what is a dog. He has no idea. I enforce that by saying, this is a dog, this is a dog, and he starts to learn. And that's ultimately how you bring up your child. What's happening in computing is exactly the same thing. These computers start with zero. So you teach it, you just feed it data. Is this a cat 
or is this a dog looking at the basket? Now, one picture is interesting. Okay, is this a dog or is this a mop? Seems very simple, right? Not so fast. <laughs> You're feeding it tens of thousands of images every single second. It's starting to get very good. It's starting to be better than a human being. I hadn't actually looked to see which were dogs before. Yeah, wow. Is this a cat or a dog? Is this a dog or a mop? Dog? We'll never know. And so on and so forth. Kittens are ice creams. Chihuahuas are muffins. You get my point. It's feeding information. It's starting to get a level of expertise. Now start to think about your industry, your data sets, your customers, your horses. Just imagine the power of that supercomputer analyzing and building patterns becomes, starts to become very powerful, right? Now this is the, the neural network in action. It starts off with one curious question. The computer will start to not only ask if it's a cat or a dog, it'll start to think about what are the other characteristics that I can learn about this cat or the dog, the personality traits, the noises it makes, and so on and so forth. And it starts to build and build and build. So in its most simplistic form of explanation, and I think that's how I think about it, everything starts with, is this an ice cream or a chihuahua at high speed? Or a muffin or a chihuahua, wasn't it? But now let's take it down to a particular use case within farming that I think will hopefully have that aha moment around whenever he talks about AI. I think if you'd have watched this hopefully yesterday, you'd have probably switched off. But now thinking about what we've just explained in that neural network, hopefully this will make some sense. Back now with our series, AI Revolution, and how artificial intelligence is hard at work on some farms, robots doing the work of dozens of people. Jake Ward has our story. Okay, yes, it's a killer robot with an AI brain. But hear me out. It kills weeds. On a 2,000-acre organic farm in Central California, this $1.2 million machine does the work of 30 people 24 hours a day. The machine is, is thinking. It's learning. It's understanding what it's seeing. What AI is great at is telling the difference between things. In this case, the difference between chard and a weed and then killing the weeds with lasers. CEO Paul Mikesell has invented a system that fries weeds too small for a human hand to grab in bursts that last only milliseconds. The field smells like burnt popcorn. The whole trick here is the lasers disrupt the cellular cycle within the plant with heat energy. It takes a rack of servers to recognize 40 crops and 80 types of weeds. This machine has got more computing power than 24 Teslas in it. It's essentially a mobile data center. Mm. The farm's owner says the laser weeder will pay for itself in a single year and that it solves his single biggest problem, which is finding workers. We're just not getting the influx of new folks that want to come in to this deal now. So hopefully you understood there. We'd have started training that model at a very basic level. But some of the business outcomes, you heard return of investment in one year. Usually it would take 30 staff to do that and they could never get close as that machine starts to learn. The human eye has got some significant limitations. So real business outcomes for the agriculture industry. And um, we'll get to the fact that, oh, but did it remove 30 jobs? I think that's also, it is a contentious uh, issue that's worth discussing. You know, I think another good example is Domino's Pizza. It's a, um, it was a, everyone's used Domino's company that started off in Australia. One of the, if you look at their stock price, one of the most successful companies that have come out of Australia. Um, Whenever they changed, and we heard from the CEO a few years ago, he came into Google and he said, when he changed the mindset to say, we're no longer a pizza company, we're a technology company that happens to sell pizza. Once they reframed their business around that, that's whenever they started to be hugely successful and huge differentiation against the competition. They started to look at just customer patterns. Who's buying what? Is a Monday, is it Margarita Monday? Is it Friday? Are people tending to do pepperoni? What's the volumes? Let's, do, let's get that data to the point where they said, actually, we can start to pre-cook 90% of what we make. We don't need to wait for the phone. You're probably all thinking, yeah, I order the same pizza every week. Humans are very um, somewhat basic individuals around habits. 
And actually, they pre-cook their pizzas. Now they do 98% of those pizzas are pre-cooked. And that's why they can say, whenever you phone for a pizza, we'll have it ready in three minutes. And they're now trying to get it to two minutes. In Japan, of course, Japan, they can get it down to two minutes, that pizza's ready because it's already cooked. They just need to do that last mile. So if you start to think about the benefits from the customer experience, start to think about the benefits around supply, there's no longer wasted food products, etc. So he really just focuses on customer experience and product quality, and yet the, the product he's selling right now is pizza. I think it's fascinating. He's also innovating unbelievable things with drones and really pushing around we're a technology company that sells pizza. I think that's a really important framing for everything that we do, that you think the humble pizza and how could that be impacted by technology. And now using AI is a little bit like ice cream. There's multiple flavors, hundreds of flavors. So I think AI, another learning is it's not, it's not one size fits all. There's many different ways that you can apply AI. This is called predictive AI because it's starting to predict what they should be purchasing, what they should be cooking. So then you just take another flavor. This is called visual inspection, visual inspection AI, a manufacturing company. Again, training the data, starting to learn about where are the defects. They start to train the data at a high speed. And now, of course, that they pick up whenever there's something wrong with the product, it gets stopped before it goes out to customers. This used to be human beings they would have to check, and of course, they get lazy or the eyes aren't as good. So the benefit to any organization, any computer company that's not using AI versus a company that is, you can start to see that the differentiation, they're just going to run away. They just cannot keep up with a company that's embracing something like visual inspection, AI, to be able to make sure they get the best product at the best price out of the customers in the fastest time. All right, I certainly relied on this this morning uh, as I set off from Sydney. Um, this was Google Maps. Hopefully you're all familiar with Google Maps and you trust us, Google. I said to Tommy, I'm here under Neil, not Google today, so anything I say <laughs> that's controversial is my own opinions. Um, we would not have a product that you would use today. It would simply not be good enough if, if AI was not baked into everything that we do. We've been banking and betting in AI for over 10 years. So this was the first um, Google Map in 2005. And I'm going to give you a sneak peek into what the next version of Google Maps is going to look like. Um, and it's, again, it is classified. Now, you plan your route, it'll give a drone of what your route's going to look like. So before you go on it, you can have a look to see what the traffic's like. It'll simulate predictive AI. It's been training the data, everything we've learned. It'll start to say, ah, the traffic looks pretty good today. If I go at this time, the weather's good. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll take this journey now and I can see the ton of traffic and see all the turns. Then you move the time, say, I don't want to go now. I want to go perhaps in two hours' time. Well, the weather's not going to be good. Be careful if you go at this time. And you can start to see the traffic is completely jammed up. So hopefully that's pretty cool. And that's all got AI baked into that product. And you can start to think about the different flavors of ice cream that we talked about. It's got predictive. It's got image AI. It's got many other forms, but ultimately it's AI is baked into that. And that's why if you use YouTube and all the other products that you trust today, it's, it's, all got, it's all really built in with AI functionality. All right, so that's kind of analytical AI. You kind of understand that it's just analyzing. It's not necessarily starting to generate uh, and ultimately communicate like a human being. When this is the big leap forward, which is called Gen AI, many hands went up in the room around ChatGBT. Just to give you an idea of the momentum that ChatGBT has been building, but also that it's just a small drop in the ocean of what's actually possible. It's just experimental at this stage, so I'm sure we're using it for some fun use cases, but you can see that when it first launched, and I know the numbers are big, but we talked about the, the machine, so the, the specific terminology for whenever you input data is called machine learning. The machine is learning each time you're feeding that data. It was using 175 billion pieces of data in order to generate outcomes whenever you type and test it. Fast forward only a few months, it's now using one trillion 
pieces of data. So that's why it's starting to get smarter. And it's the compounding of the amount of data that it's going to get in weeks and months. The usefulness that that will generate, it, it, it's astounding where it can get to in terms of the level of professional copywriting, the level of digital imaging it can creating, the level of uh, uh, deep fakes that it can do. Like This is still at the cusp. Um, two interesting insights. The ChatGBT3, the first version, got 70% in the medical exam to, to pass to be a doctor in the US, and that was untrained. It wasn't actually specific, giving it specific medical data. It was just using out-of-the-box ChatGBT. That blows my mind, Met the, the, the legal bar to be a barrister in the US. Kim Kardashian passed it, so perhaps it's not too high, but um, uh, they get 92%. So you can see that legal is more based on logic, more analytical AI. You know, obviously with medical exams, it starts to have much more generative AI because it starts to have to use sentiment, it has to make some decisions. So it get much better mark at this stage in legal, but just think, just zoom out of that and think about third world countries that don't get access to the same level of medical care that they do in the US you can start to potentially use technology to be able to help with patient care in third world countries. Think about, from a customer perspective, we don't have to engage with a lawyer sometimes, and we can get tasks done, and the, the, the speed. And of course, it's going to get smarter and smarter and smarter, so it'll be able to just have the precision around being able to give advice on legal matters, amazing opportunities in the future. And the, the, whilst it's, you know, the adoption is one billion visits in three months, just, 10 times anything else we've ever seen. So really exciting and I'd encourage you all to use it. I think most of you have it. Just keep asking it and interrogating it. We're gonna have some fun in real time. Yeah, I'm doing that um, after the session or maybe after lunch. Cool, so I'm just gonna spin through just some examples of, we've, we've talked about the Morgan Freeman deep fake, impressive but kind of sci-fi and nothing for me. This is automotive industry, how they're using Gen AI. The insight is that 90% of cars are a commodity where they pay money for what you pay money for is the service and the service quality and the reliability of making sure that car stays on the road. So um, chatbots a couple of years ago were awful because generative AI wasn't around. So I don't know if you've used them and I'm still a little bit gun shy when I see a chatbot, but hopefully you're seeing that they're getting a lot better because now generative AI has been launched and because that data is now becoming into the trillions. So you can see that it proactively notifies you that cruise control is on and it'll start to have a full conversation. This has actually been gone live in a couple of premium car manufacturers in the US. So think about first use case would be, how do you potentially, if you don't have too, much, too many staff, how do you begin to think about utilizing chatbots? And again, that would be something that would be so complex and so expensive only a couple of years ago if I was a little bit more technical and I've seen the demo, you can spin up a chatbot in less than five minutes. Just feed it the data, give it access to some, some specific data in your organization. It can start to learn and it'll be terrible for the first day and it'll learn really, really quickly and it'll become really efficient in a matter of days and, short, and, and weeks. So you can see here, it's just beginning to have a full conversation. This is, I think this is just a fun one. So we're talking about, that was text chatting but how do you take it to the next level, which is actually having a full conversation? What I like to think about it is we've, we've had to-do lists for many years, but there's gonna be a leap forward to sit, call the getting things done list. So you will write on there, I wanna book a hair appointment, that's your to-do list, and then there's no reason why you're using generative AI, that can get done for you, such as this video. You're making a phone call, maybe call a plumber in the middle of the week, or even schedule a haircut appointment. You wanna ask Google, to make you a haircut appointment, let's listen. So this is the Hi, chat box. Hi, I'm this one. to book a haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's mimicking. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. 
Perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. So again, just want to give you again a different potential outcome of gen generative AI. It's generating on behalf of the, of the user. Um, this one, when I showed Tommy, he said, this one will resonate. Um, just think about just pages and pages, terabytes and terabytes of, of documents. Well, that I saw pedigree pages when I saw that. Right. I didn't my name Neil, but. Right. So again, this, in its most simplest form, all you have to do is just ingest that document. And in seconds, you can then just start to interrogate that document. So rather than going through hundreds of thousands of pages, you can just say, what is the sustainability strategy? It will start to pull out those specific insights. So again, apply that to your industry and thinking about getting access to data, driving insights, looking at, the, looking at competition, but being able to interrogate, you just need to give access to the, uh, give access to the data, let the machine learning start to, 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 to build up, and then you've got a um, really, really interesting use case. So you can start to ask it anything you like. So I think that's pretty cool. All right, just last couple of slides from me, I think. Big topic, I think, will AI impact jobs? I pulled this, I thought it was interesting that every generation there's always been innovation. Back in the 1800s, machinery will take away factory jobs. The one that I've put the chart up is 1980s. The ATMs were going to disrupt banking and will take away tellers' jobs. You can see that there's actually a correlation to more staff being employed at the same rate of the ATMs and being installed. And I fundamentally do believe in this statement will be true that I don't believe that AI will replace jobs. It will displace jobs. But some jobs will get replaced with newer jobs. Others become more productive as technology automates certain tasks. I believe that you can start to use AI, like the piece of clay we described, to start to point it in the direction of tasks that you can displace a human being, but get that human being to actually drive more thoughtful tasks. They're never going to have as much human beings with empathy and personality. And you know, I really think it's, that's, that's the way to think about AI, not necessarily that it will replace jobs at the expense of the people having to leave. And I think history will tell us the history will play out in a similar way. So I think the last slide is, again, similar to my um, thoughts on, on AI and losing jobs. You, you're not competing with AI. But I fundamentally believe that you will be competing with your competitor that is using AI. Can you imagine if we were to build, bring out Google Maps today I and mean, we're competing against Google without AI, if you do, can bring out a, trying to launch a new computer that wasn't using the AI for, to, for, for looking at the defects, it would be like trying to climb up a mountain with a backpack full of rocks, but your competitor is utilizing AI to get them up there. They don't have to carry the heavy rocks. They know exactly where they're going. They know when to leave. Yes, it's possible, but in the future, It'll be very, very difficult. Now, the key piece is how do you find ways to harness AI and make it useful for your organization? And that's really where the partnerships that I think Tommy will be talking about. But back to what Sundar, our CEO, said, it, it'll have as big an impact on society as electricity and fire. And he, you know, he, he doesn't make those light comments unless it's been vetted and there's a substantial data and a substantial insight that that's, and that's, if you look at any other futurists, they say that is AI is not going to have the biggest impact on technology. It will actually have the biggest impact on humanity in the coming years. And um, so I think it's about that human imagination, thinking about where can you use this amazing tool? How do you shape this clay? And then utilize that and combine that with the power of analytical AI, which hopefully when you go home tonight, you'll explain just doesn't get tired, just analyzes data and can help provide insight. Or generative AI, we can actually start to generate that insight through text, through audio, through imagery. And I think it's that combination that we should all be excited about. And I think, yes, I don't know if the front end to the back end of a horse, but I think you're interested in profitability, you're interested in customer service, you're interested in reaching new markets. And that's 
all an opportunity to really think about how we'd utilize AI. So, um, so I think maybe we're going to we'll pass to Tommy now, but this is a closing thought. I start to think about how your industry can leverage AI to optimize uh, each worker's tasks. So I didn't get the squid you want, so hopefully you, you learn a little bit. You learn what AI is. You learn what demystified AI that is just computing power and it's just data, but happening at a scale that's just profound. And I think the last piece is just the, the opportunity for all of us to really, and I, I'm, you know, whilst I don't know anything about your industry, I'm here today to learn and think about how can companies like Google start to do a better job of understanding your wants and needs and how do we find a way to connect and really start to be helpful and get you to get moving in this journey, of course, through um, organizations such as, such as Breeder. So. Just while I'm waiting for Tommy, maybe we'll just start with a bit of fun. So I'm going to use an image generator here. Does anybody want to be brave and come up with just as random a picture? You can see here, Tommy, if nobody else has got another suggestion, Tommy said he wants to see a racehorse running across the Harbour Bridge in the rain. So if anyone can beat that, otherwise we'll go with that. But just to give you an idea, will we go with that one, Tommy? Any other, there's an avocado, there's a, an armchair in the shape of an avocado. So, you know, there's some pretty creative. But what the magic is here is just to give you an idea. This is not searching Google and finding an existing image. This is, remember, machine learning. It's been, it understands avocado, it understands sofa. How do I generate something that'll be useful? So. Anybody hung over and his brain's thinking about really weird things that you want to share? Just do Tommy's one, I think. Tommy's one? All right. So think about marketing, thinking about your, your brand, thinking about just the opportunities that normally this would have to go to an agency. People pay to collect your top dollars if you're at these things. Wow, look at that. So that one's pretty cool. So this, is, this image has never existed before. This has been built in less than five seconds. I saw a video when I was researching yesterday. Um, I, um, someone built an, a Nike marketing video, the full campaign, and he did it in 12 minutes. And that would normally take an agency, they would commit to two or three months and hundreds of thousands. And it was really emotive. So the opportunity to you think about that from a brand. So yeah, racehorse running over the Harbour Bridge in the rain. I think that's pretty cool and that could be your image. So that's just one example of using generative AI for, for image creation. So maybe go back to the discussion. I was just yeah. killing time you were living. Um, I was just gonna pass this microphone down the road and just fire something abstract of what you've talked about, the, the deal, and we'll pump it into the It system. doesn't even need to be a demo, just any thoughts or yeah. observations from the session we'd love to learn. We can use the different options are yeah, we can ask we can help me write, we can write business plans, we can think of newsletters. Well I will leave with one. Yeah. Um, could you show me a business plan on how I'd sell more bloodstock through uh, more bloodstock online? I couldn't, but I'll write it and we'll try. So this is within Google Docs now. There's a function I don't think it's been released just yet, but it's called Help Me Write. So how often do we sit and think, I need to get started? Where do I start? How do I start to build a SWOT analysis or build a performance review for my team? Or Now you just write this here and it will start to craft and pull again. It's, it'll generate um, the email or the document that you want and, and then you can start to interrogate it to build it out. So what was the question? Please build me a business plan. You're very polite, please, okay. <laughs> Build me a business plan. On how to sell more horses. More race horses or yes. horses? Online. Uh, I'm a bit nervous on this one. I don't know if thinking. There you go. So here's the business plan executive summary. It a strategy, includes a market analysis, marketing plan, financial projections, 
then it starts to break down each section. So again, it, it gives you structure. Now you could start to then actually say, give me specifics around the financial predictions, but it, you know, right now you asked it for the structure. Now you can actually refine that and say, hang on a second, I actually want to elaborate even more. So it'll go back and it will continue to build and build. And it's funny because I even have the view of, oh, I don't want to keep asking it because you're so used to like asking a human being, but it, it's, it's thirsty to kind of keep um, building and, and adding more information or keep getting, being interrogated. So that's just one example. And then you can, you can even change the, so it doesn't have much more there. So then just as an example, you can, I won't do it, but you can make the tone formal, you can make the tone casual, you can get it to bulletize that and so on and so forth. That was just one example. Um, again, you just get, get moving really quickly and that's built in. We have that built into Google Docs, but I'm sure it'll be built into um, Office 365 as well and also into Google Slides and PowerPoint where you can start to generate that to get you building slides. And you can actually start to create, if you wanted to, you could say create slides for this and then it will go and move create slides with all the topics and you get moving really quickly, so pretty cool. Now it's just made it into a short bullet and you can just insert and off you go. Can you call or otherwise just pass it? I'll, I'll pass it off the time. Yeah. Um, this is more of a question, but yeah. a huge part of um, the Terabit Industries does held behind like logins. So, for example, our studbook, we have everyone has to log in to access all the data. Mm. What are the legalities about feeding our logins to, we'll say, ChatGPT for it to learn more information? Yeah, it's a great question. So, there's two. There's ultimately two versions of generative AI from a Google perspective. Um, our equivalent of ChatGBT is called Bard. If you've heard of Bard, it's exactly the same product. Quick advert means that we're directly connected to the, to the internet, so our data is instantaneous versus our friends at ChatGBT. They need to keep having a manual connector and downloading that information. So one of the benefits of Google is we've got access to YouTube data and you know, the internet, because that's what we've been doing on search. Advert over. Um, so BARD is the consumer version, and anything you feed it is open to everybody. Samsung recently, it's been in the press, they started to use it as part of product strategy and started to share a lot of information to try and get the most accurate answer. Fortunately, that information was shared because the competitors very quickly understood what they were doing, and it was a real misstep from them. But well, there's also a commercial offering in Google, it's called uh, Vortex AI. And that is the one that you would use for your business because that ultimately is something called an API, which is a connector. You would connect that, and that is only your information. So it's completely sandboxed, so you can have full control. And that's where it really becomes interesting around help me write, for example. When that gets connected to your own organization, it will pull only the data that's relevant. It will start to understand sentiment of exactly how you write, the style of your writing, and you can open it up to as much or as little. Um, but it's all your own data that's, that's then isolated within Google Cloud's data center. So yeah, very different products. My recommendation would be don't do anything across JetGBT or for Bard, it's a consumer product. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a really great question. Um, what about copyright laws in terms of um, that business plan you had there before? Um, if, can you use that directly, or do you have to put that in your own words? Like, again, it's done in, when it's done in consumer version. Just be cautious around copyright and accuracy. There's been I don't know if you heard about a case. A lawyer must have decided to take some shortcuts in the U.S. and use Bar to write his case notes, and he stood up very confidently in court and cited three examples of where his client should be innocent because of these potential, and they were all wrong. And his client, you know, um, they, weren't even there. they weren't even there. Okay, my point. So I think, yeah, again, the next evolution is when you start to actually get the commercial version and you only get access and then you know the copy is yours. So it's, a, it's an area I think, you know, there's definitely needs to be some legislation, some parameters around these sorts of things. But in short, be careful if you're using BARD or ChatGBT uh, when you start to, you know, it's great for frameworks and examples, but from a copyright perspective, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a gray area. You know, Neil, um, does Bard, do, what you said before, does that mean that Bard has access to the internet up till now? And exactly. 2019 or whatever, chat GP. Exactly. So he's right. Yeah. And when's Copilot coming out? 
Isn't co- Copilot's like the it's uh, a Microsoft connected version? Connected into Microsoft. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Copilot is the terminology for what I've just shown you on Help Me Write. That's Microsoft's product offering. I think it's the same thing. I think it's in what's called Trusted Tester right now, and I think enterprise customers have access to it. So, um, yeah, Copilot, similar characteristics. A good knowledge of Copilot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was just going to go back to Neve's point on API. One of the problems we have in the racing breeding industry is we we might struggle to get that API. Are there any examples from the tech world where a campaign has been well run to push the holders of that data to open up? I, I don't have examples, but the APIs and the ability to connect the data and to get up and running is, is I'm gonna, not going to say so simple, but compared to six months ago, the, the structure of the way APIs are put in place and the ability to connect very quickly has been revolutionary in the last few months. So I, I, don't, you know, I can think of many customers that are utilizing this and they can get up, to, get up and running in days and weeks rather than the months and years that it have taken historic, uh, previously. So I'd love to hear more on that. And I could probably love to connect with you and try and help or put you in touch with someone that could actually get you to begin to build a prototype of some sort. But I don't have specific examples. I thought you were going to give me a really creative image generator. I was excited. <laughs> Those are the guys who actually pay us to come up with those images, so they're not too much ah, right. too much study in marketing. Online. <laughs> I, um... I was just um, looking at things from a diagnostic p- point of view, from a purely p- front-facing sort of situation, looking at herds of animals, and when you look at sort of other commercial agricultural industries, they're utilizing tech everywhere and, and data and information to optimize production. I guess the really interesting thing about the thoroughbred industry is that each particular unit that we develop is of incredibly high value in its own right. Mm. So each, each horse that gets produced, you're not looking at them as a herd as such. We don't kind of look at them like that. So they fit somewhere in between production animals and yeah. you know, companion animals in the way that they're sort of looked at by humans. I, I'd be really interested to see how we actually collect that data from each individual animal to individualise their medicine a whole lot more. Mm. So we look at things like, like is happening in human medicine, that, that the idea that you just give a dose rate for a particular animal because that's the data from way, way ago, you know, hundred, hundreds of years ago, we, we keep utilising those sorts of dose rates in each individual. Surely we're we're going to get better at mm. looking at, at physiology of each individual unit because they're, u- they're worth so much in their own right. You know, you're not looking at it as just a herd. And in managing of those herds as well, looking at monitoring their, their physiology and how they're responding, early detection of disease and all those sorts of things. Yeah, amazing point. And I think, um, I actually, if I type in the key use cases, which I did last night, for AI in the horse breeding industry, it, it, the summary was very aligned to what you just mentioned. It's about thinking about the physiology and the research and making sure you can optimize your foals. And I'll, let me just type it and see if it can use cases for in the horse breeding. Is that right? Um, and I think, yeah, I think it's those data sets. And I think for me, the quantum computing piece that I mentioned, a lot of that is around the ability um, to really make significant breakthroughs in health and life sciences and those sorts of things that would just be being possible from a human perspective. So you can see, I think, a little bit like what you mentioned, you know, identifying selecting breeding stock with the best genetic potential, monitoring the health and well-being of horses, developing training programs. So I think, you know, perhaps at the start when you saw AI, you thought that's not, not an area that can help my industry or my business, but I think these are some really interesting top level areas that would be worth having much deeper discussions around. Yeah. The really interesting thing about that is AI is also artificial insemination. Oh, <laughs> there you go. Oh, wow. 
<laughs> right, right. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Just a bit further on in regards to this, obviously on, on the stud farms, there's numerous number of people inputting data, particularly on young horses. Mm being able to have a select industry or farm orientated where all the information can go in as far as ratings of a horse pedigree and then obviously spill out the particulars of that how far off or is there ways to be able to do that to benefit you know rather than sitting around at a table you know spitting out what horses should go to what sale particularly or is it well, I mean, I think More. that's a perfect use case. I can't yeah. think of any barriers, and that's exactly, if you think about the analytical AI in terms of how do you really start to spot patterns and looking at huge data sets and really taking a lot of the legwork that getting around the table and just the limitations. So, like, that would be a great use case to try and think about. I think Tom said that you have... Uh, data puddles versus data lakes. I think that's the terminology we use at Google is how do you get those puddles into that unified lake that you can really unleash the power? Because it's only as good as data in and data out, right? Like I think it, then the, you know, right now, the you know, humans would control what that looks like. But yeah. Being able to go back years of sales data for yeah. a particular farm to put that in and then obviously you're, you're missing probably the, the physical attributes that are physical ratings well, you, we would have it on the system. Yeah. You just have to input all that in. And then there's systems where you can have that specific for your farm only. Right. And, and keep it in house a Yeah. And there's something that I saw a demo last week. Um, I think someone mentioned code before. I think you said you don't write a line of code. There's something called uh, low code and no code. And again, we talked about the evolution that's happening so fast is there's this whole phenomena around no code, which gives you the ability to actually spin up an app, and, and again, using generative AI, and I saw the, the demo for a coffee shop, but the same premise is, you just give it access to whatever data feeds, and it will start to, to simulate and build a database or an app that you can then start to find, and like you just mentioned, it could be going back years and years and start to surface info. So before, to build that, you'd have coding and data scientists and a fortune, but now it's got to the place, and it will go, a heck of a lot further very quickly where using no code, just asking it the business, or presenting the business problem, it will start, potentially start to simulate that for you in real time. I've got one follow-up question to that. A lot of the data that we need or we consume is actually owned by a controlling body like the stud book or Arion pedigrees or whatever it might be. Is there a trend where data providers or software vendors provide those AI tools to consumers? Do we have to rely on that or w will they allow us to interrogate that data, you know, talking about a login, for example, mm -hmm. what, what's, what are some of the trends in other industries? How can we access that data um, and work with those controlling bodies? I mean, it, the simple answer would be, it would be the same conversation that you would have to access the data in a more traditional sense, if they'd be willing to or whatever, who owns the copyright, etc. But um, that's absolutely the path would be once you get permissions and access to the right data feeds, you can open up APIs with, with as much limitations as they would agree to, to give you the, the right level of data to provide the outcome that you're looking for. So, you know, I think many customers that we work with, I work with Woolworths, for example, and, you know, in order to create, hopefully you've noticed that the quality of the, the chat bot and the quality of the online services and, and that they're accessing both external data and internal data and, you know, they are in control and they are really deciding that. They would have a sandboxed environment within Google Cloud that would really allow the AI to interrogate, but it's, it's their data or it's their customer's data. So, but as I mentioned before, that's the, that's the more commercial conversation rather than the barred piece where you wouldn't want to give any access to confidential or sensitive data to the consumer version. I'll, I'll, I'll send this to Tom and maybe he can send it out just about some specific AI use cases within your industry. So hopefully we've evolved from Morgan Freeman sci-fi to kind of some very practical ideas here that might be, resonate with all of you. So yeah, thanks a lot. That was great and look forward to spending the day with you. Cool. Cheers. All right. Um, look, I hope everyone enjoyed that insightful um, session. Um, I think we've got some interesting ideas here. And you would have gathered pretty quickly that a lot of that AI discussion is around data and our access to it. And there's no 
two better gentlemen in the thoroughbred breeding space that deal with data on a daily basis and understand, understand the importance of data. Um, but Matthew Innes from Group 1 Goldmine, and we've also got Alan Benetto from Prism. Um, not only their expertise in and around data in the thoroughbred <coughs> racing and breeding industry, but um, their broader understanding of data and other enterprises they've been involved with. So, without too much yet from myself, I'm going to try to map first and then we'll go to Alan. <coughs> I'll do a quick demo and then we'll open it up. So, to questions um, from either in and around data. So, just keep those questions to yourselves and uh, we'll go to a panel after we've reached a bit of a chat. But if I could try to, Matt Innes, can you hear us clearly, Matt? Yeah, I can. Thanks, Tom. Wonderful. Over to you. So I'm just going to run through um, some of the slides that I have here, um, just to give you an idea. Firstly, those of you that don't know what G1 Gold Mine's about, um, I know a lot of our customers are there, both breeders and farms alike, which is good. So you guys know a lot of this already. Um, with G1 Gold Mine, there's three key features. Um, the first one would be pedigree search. And that's where you can basically search any combination of ancestor to determine this, the success rate, um, including a list of snake species. From this small picture here, you can see on the left-hand side. And it also gives you the ideal distance and age for whatever search you do. So, for example, you might start off simple and put a sire in that position, or you can do multiple combinations within a pedigree. You can search by um, quartiles. You can search by halves. You can even search by generations. Um, we also have a really cool feature within pedigree search where if you put in anything on the top half and click search, this affinity matrix tab will appear and it will actually give you every ancestor up to seven generations um, that are within the most, sorry, the most common ancestors within seven generations. So if I search the street cry, for example, and I click that affinity matrix tab, I would then get a, a list of all the common ancestors that is found on the dam side. So that's a really powerful tool for breeders um, because they can actually enter any ancestor within their female side in that bottom half and it will reverse the search. So it will tell them what the most common ancestors within a size family and then they can start drilling down that way. Um, so that's pedigree research. The next main feature is stadium match. Um, most of the farms in Australia already utilise stadium match and that's where they pay to promote their stadiums on the platform, meaning that anyone can run a search for free. So it's a really good starting point for a mare owner to put in their mare against any stadium. It'll search up to five generations on both the male and the female side and they basically give you a list of the global stakes winners that match that pedigree. Um, a lot of the nicking tools only really rely on the female, uh, sorry, the male side. Stadium Match looks at every single ancestral spot within five generations. Um, so it's, again, it's a very powerful tool and it's kind of like a top of funnel tool to give a breeder a bit of a starting position on where to look. Obviously, the whole premise of that feature is to replicate success. So if you were to do a search, you would, you know, be hoping in an ideal world that that pedigree over five generations has multiple stakes winners that are closely related to that pedigree. Um, so it's a very, very good tool, and that's probably our most our most um, popular feature. Uh, the last one is our pro feature. So if you're a pro member, you get access to this impact profiling, um, and that basically is where we're adding automation into the search. So it will look at 20 key crosses within five generations on both the male, again, and the female lines. And it will tell you using an algorithm, basically, if <clears throat> that particular cross has outperformed or underperformed expectation. An outperformed expectation is highlighted in the green and gold. And in this one, in this example, we don't have it, but an underperforming would be a red cell. And that's where it's had a negative impact on that pedigree. Um, at the end of last year, we did a study, and there is definitely a correlation between gold and green and stakes winners, which um, I'll touch on. In the next slide. So this was the study that we looked at um, and these are just the three, there's lots of things that came out of it but the three highlights for us were, <clears throat> excuse me, that 
15% of stakes winners held a perfect match within stadium match, which, you know, is a huge um, opportunity gain. It's about five times the normal. So we found that the normal for underperforming horses was around 3%. Um, the normal for searches on the platform, and we get about 60,000 searches a week. So the normal for those searches is about 1.5%. So a stakes winning population is running at 15%, um, which is, you know, in our industry, it's huge. When you're trying to mitigate all those little risks, um, that's a huge gain five times. The second thing to come out of it was that 34% of stakes winners were rated an excellent or an outstanding. So <clears throat> we do all types of analysis. We do um, sales catalogs where we look at yearlings and broodmares. Um, we do uh, any kind of... Um, broodmare analysis report. So a breeder can put in a broodmare and we'll search up to 250 stallions in a particular region and within a particular fee range. Um, and each hypothetical, if you like, or each yearling at a sale is given a rating and it's outstanding, excellent, good, neutral and poor. And we found that the ones that were rated excellent or outstanding um, were far more likely to become stakes winner than not. Um, so, again, that just proves that the rating system works. The way that our rating system works is we take, it weights the stallion match, so I kind of go back, it weights this stallion match rating of that particular horse or hypothetical, and then it also weights this impact profile rating. And if, a, if we have, out of these 20 crosses that we're looking, remember, on both the male and the female side, if we find that um, there's more positive crosses on one side only, so on either the male or the female, it's less weighted than one that's distributed amongst the male and female sides. Um, so that here, the 34% rated excellent or outstanding, um, again, is a massive opportunity gain when we're looking to breed or buy a thoroughbred. Um, the last one, which is what I touched on earlier, is 91% of the stakes winners have multiple, so that's more than two, gold cells within their profile. So, again, if I go back and we look at this particular impact profile, this one has four. Um, we found that stakes winners, 91% of them have two or more, um, which is, again, it's a huge stat. And it shows that our profiling system in terms of that impact profile analysis is a really, really good indication um, because it shows if a pedigree or a particular cross in a pedigree is outperforming expectation, then it has a good chance of running on and becoming a stakes winner. Um, so there, there's some of the facts on what we're currently doing now. Uh, as we look to the future, um, it's I'm not too sure what's been said already. Um, it's kind of both exciting and, and a little bit scary. Um, we're, we're gonna, we've got three main pillars that we're going to be look, looking to do. The first one is to create better predictive modelling. That impact profiling, that does change over time, and that's kind of like a bit of a first step into the predictive modelling, if you like. Um, we're going to be um, running all different types of models, or we, we currently are, um, and they're not just towards the breeding industry. It's for the breeding. Uh, it's also for the punting industry. Um, but as the access to technology, the access to data uh, increases, so does the opportunity for us to create models that can better predict uh, the outcome of, of whatever we're trying to do. So whether that's to decide the winner of a race, whether that's to decide the outcome of a hypothetical mating, or whether that's to decide the potency of a to particular stallion um, after its third or fourth year. Um, the second thing that we're going to try and do is where we want to look to um, reform, update the pedigree page. So um, we're, we're, we're quite active at sales. We, we buy, we sell. Um, and I, I think, um, you know, as good as the catalogs are, they really only paint the picture for one side. And, and I would really like to leverage our data and the ability to um, create 
it, you know, technology, create it in a way for the user to be able to interact with a pedigree to gain insights that are specific for them. Um, that might be uh, anything for, you know, distance. Um, again, we can draw from a particular cross how successful that is. Some people, um, you know, like line breeding, some people like sex balancing, all different things we should be able to apply to an interactive chart, um, which will make it a lot more meaningful to that end user. So um, that's one of the other areas that we're going to be looking at. And lastly, um, we all know that our industry is high risk, um, but data ultimately empowers stakeholders to make informed decisions and we have to use it so that we can mitigate that risk effectively. Um, you know, it's of my opinion that even, even if we can claw back one, two, three percent and we can do that, you know, 10 times, then that's going to have a massive impact on our result of the uh, horse that we ultimately buy or, or we breed. Um, three main impacts that you know we hope G1 Goldmine has on the industry: um, increased participation. Uh, I think we all want to see increased participation. And as success grows of the person that buys, uh, breeds, or sells, so too will the acceptance um, and the participation. So I think it's really, really important. Um, that we we leverage the information that is available to us. Um, you know, these, unfortunately, we're in a position where we have to do a lot of it manually. It would be great if um, we had had a little bit more availability globally. Uh, currently, we've got a team of, you know, 40 offshore that are basically manually entering um a lot of races. It's about 5,000 races a week uh, into our system. We add 2,000 horses a week into our database. We've got a database of over three and a half million horses currently. Um, so if, I think, you know, if we follow the way that other sports have attacked their data and providing the data, then I think um, we've got a really good opportunity to increase the participation even further. Um, which kind of leads on to the next point, which is data back deficiency. So I think it goes without saying that computers are a lot smarter than us. Um, and then if the programs are created correctly and they're leveraging the correct data, then um, the efficiency gained in all aspects is um, kind of mind, mind blowing really when you think about it. It's probably important to note, this is never gonna take away from someone's eye or the ability to look at a horse um, and judge the confirmation or the type or the walk of that particular horse. Um, all we're kind of doing is saying, you know, we can look at these data points and we can cross-reference those data points against every runner globally and, and look for trends, um, which is something a human being just can't do, unfortunately. Um, to give you a bit of perspective, um, we've got, you know, millions of horses in our database. Each horse has about 500 data points to it, which means these. 675 million connections within a pedigree. Uh, you know, a human can't do that, unfortunately. Um, and the last point is diversity. The di diversity in the bloodlines is a really big one, and it's kind of been touched on in North America over the last few years. Uh, and I think it's really, really important and something that we should think about. Um, you know, there's no doubt that commerciality drives our industry, and, and, and that's a good thing. The farms do so much for our industry, and without them, uh, I think we would we would struggle a little bit, which other jurisdictions globally are. Um, but I think we should also not eliminate a non-commercial stallion. Um, there is definitely the way that the, the world operates now and those bloodlines in a non-commercial stallion from all over the world. And you can use tools like us to find out exactly if that cross or that cross with your mare is going to be effective or not, or if it has been effective or not. Um, so I think, you know, it's it's kind of our goal to increase the diversity and not always go back to that same stadium, just, to, you know, at the very least give an opportunity to a breeder just to have a think about another option. Um, I think that's something that we should definitely strive for in for the long run. Okay, thanks. 
Um, firstly, thanks, uh, Tom, in particular, for organising today. Um, sorry I couldn't get there, um, but Tom and I have had many, many conversations about the industry over the years and um, and innovation or, or lack thereof. Um, and so I think um, it's uh, it's important that we as an industry get together for these type of things. Um, it's it's we all love the industry. Um, I think there's a lot of fragmentation. There's a lot of uh, issues, but collectively, I think you know change is coming, um, and I think it's important that we kind of align as participants. Um, um, quick background for us: we've been around since about 2016, so pretty young. Um, we've been considered as the world's leading software for equine management. Um, we've kind of built from the ground up. We're cloud-based, um, spent a lot of time in the training world um, and the syndication world, and then have started to kind of move into um, stud and, and breeding operations. Um, head offices in Melbourne, we've got over 20 staff that um, support uh, our clients and, and our development. Um, the platform covers the entire spectrum of equine, um, so everything from communication, breeding, finance, billing, um, it's kind of, it's all there. Um, we don't want to be the be all and end all. We're kind of a centralised portal um, with a whole heap of integrations to other other services, whether it's data, whether it's payments, whether it's, um, you know, sales or whether it's, you know, breeding, uh, um, which Tom will take you through in a sec. Um, I won't go through this in any detail, but I think the key for us is these are all modules that sit inside the Prism platform. Um, you can turn them on or off as you need. Um, but I think the key um, item that this demonstrates is all of the relevant data points that sit inside um, the operation of a, of, a, of a thoroughbred business, whether it's breeding or, or racing. Um, all of this data is sitting there somewhere. Um, and, you know, it's just how do we actually um, build upon that and, and collectively drive the industry forward? Um, and it's not just us. There's others that are doing the same thing and there's other little add-ons and stuff. That, so there's all these different data points um, that can make the industry better. It's just how do we actually get there? So industry current state, um, you know, I don't think this is any surprise to anyone in this room. Um, you know, it's still fairly archaic compared to many other industries. Um, so we have a, my, my business, I also have another development business with investments in other technology companies and, and certainly the racing industry and the, um, uh, it's probably the one that lags the most, um, but probably the one that has the most upside if we get it right. Um, it continues to operate in silos, um, pretty comfortable in traditional workflows, um, technology seen as an expense versus an investment. Um, which I'll touch on shortly. Um, and I think, you know, there's competing interests across all levels of the industry, starting from the very top, um, you know, right down to, you know, the states and whatnot. Um, so this kind of makes it, this, this is not a fertile ground for innovation, um, but there is, there is plenty that can happen and there's plenty that we can do. Um, so I think, you know, for us, you know, sitting where we do at the intersection of all these different stakeholders, we are seeing more interest in technology and solutions and how technology can help make the industry more efficient. Um, you know, today's event's a perfect case, you know, in point. Um, we as a business are starting to see a whole heap of customization requests coming from our, our clients who want to basically tailor their solution to their own operation. Um, the more progressive clients are starting to see a return on that investment, um, which is great. So we're starting to prove out that model of customization and, and real data-driven decisions. Um, and I think this was a point I just touched on at the start was you know, change is, is coming, um, but and it's, it's, it's inevitable. Um, but I think the, the, the key thing here is that it's going to have to come from inside, like as in inside this room, uh, a do-it-yourself approach. Um, you know, we kind of, I would say there's, the industry doesn't have huge leadership in terms of, uh, you know, the governing body driving innovation forward. Um, and so I think that a lot of the, um, the change will have to come from, you know, participants in this room and, and you know, technology service providers um, to sort of push that forward. So in terms of just a few things around, you know, what we see is, is coming down the line, um, 
and it sort of varies across, across a, a variety of different elements. But connectivity is a really excuse me. Connectivity is a really interesting one. Um, obviously, technology requires connectivity and quick connectivity, um, and that's kind of been an issue up until now. So that's that's always been an external um, problem, but um, we're now starting to see these providers uh, like Starlink, which I'm not sure if anyone uses or has heard of, but the Elon Musk's um, satellite-based uh, network, um, which is becoming cheaper, uh, providing some really strong uh, connectivity. Um, some of our clients who have used it um, have seen huge uh, improvement in their um, uh, download speeds, upload speeds, which makes which kind of opens up all these cloud services that we talk to um, that were not previously available um, to rural areas now available. Um, connected services. So this is kind of the, the IT industry is um, has always kind of had this uh, open approach. Um, and it's kind of taken a little while for, for certain sectors of that industry to catch up. Um, what we mean by connected services are, you know, essentially the businesses that we work with, um, you know, providing unique or niche elements um, that are connected into other services to provide, you know, a one plus one equals three result. Um, that's only going to get um, uh, more prevalent as we go forward. Um, and so you'll see a lot more of these microservices or connected services um, start to build out. Customization. Um, so as I said before, this is, an, this is a, a section that's kind of um, take up a lot of our time, but it, it's providing um, uh, uh, there is no one size that fits all and, and uh, the more progressive clients um, are starting to uh, invest in that customization. Um, some of it will be operational efficiency, some of it will be data services, um, and I think when you get into this connected services approach, um, that will only um, drive the customization forward. Um, and then data and AI, I know there's been a couple of conversations already on that. Um, back to that kind of spider web of data that we had before is, you know, you take that plus, you know, other connected services out there. Wearables um, is becoming a big thing now. Welfare is obviously really important. Performance is really important. But you're starting to see a lot more data collection um, happening. Uh, you know, physical wearables are now um, starting to become more and more popular. Um, we've got integrations to a couple of those. Um, and certainly the, the more progressive stables, particularly from a racing perspective, are starting to use um, that data to, to help predict, you know, patterns and, and injury and, and whatnot. And I think that once you start getting this aggregation of data, the increased connectivity helps as well. Um, but this whole data play, um, there is so much data out there in the industry um, across the board. You've, we've got to try and get it in as, as best shape as we can. And then you start looking at you know, AI and machine learning models for predictive analysis, interpretation, um, that whole element. So you'll find that we get better decisions, um, particularly around performance and welfare of horses. Uh, some of the stuff that Matt alluded to in terms of pedigree um, is only going to get more and more, and more um, efficient um, with better decisions made in around the breeding industry. Um, so there's this whole huge opportunity, particularly, um, I mean, the reality is, is that we're dealing with animals that, you know, that can't talk to us. So we need data to help us interpret um, what they're doing, what they're going through. Um, and there's a heap of, you know, um, vendors out there that are starting to look into that space. And then the last two, they're kind of a little bit into, intertwined, but um, I think transparency. Um, so that is, that's kind of across the board. So, um, you know, we've got, we've got our typical welfare groups, we've got our owners, we've got our PRAs and those that govern the sport, um, you know, even state by state. Um, you know, I, I think the, the the industry is kind of fragmented in that way, but um, we do need to start coming together and being more transparent about, you know, particularly the, the horse. Um, we're looking for improved communications, improved security, professionalism in the industry and also efficiency. So this whole transparency around data and or performance, um, you know, is not going away. Um, I think the the last point there is also one that um, I think it's inevitable um, at some point. Um, I, we, from a prison perspective, we've been talking about it since we started. 
Um, I'm not sure if we're any closer to it, um, but, you know, if the industry wants to continue with its social license, we need to start investing into these type of um, operations and platforms that, that allow um, us to manage horses from cradle to grave. Um, and it's, it's, I don't know, I can't tell you where or how it starts, but, um, you know, there are things, if you think about all the data that is currently in, inside stables and breeding operations, um, there are now, you know, technologies to catch that up to, to make sure that it's secure and efficient like blockchain. Um, and I think that ev eventually we're going to have to get to this point. Um, but, you know, where and how that starts and, and how we get there, you know, I think, again, it starts in this room um, and we just have to kind of shove it forward and, and see how far we can we can push it. Um, so that was that was kind of my presentation. It was more focused on you know some of these key elements that are um, that are coming up. Um, I don't think there's anything scary in any of that. Um, I think it's kind of on the industry to, to start working closer together to to push this along. And, and again, you know, big thanks to you, Tom, for for organising this event, which is you know possibly one of the starting points. To start it off, if I went to the breeder homepage, I'm coming to register. I want this now, in the next couple of years, to be what we'll term uh, as a KYC registration. KYC will be explained in the next uh, section by Andrew Jarvis. If KYC is the new system to identify clients in your banking, finance and everything in, in, in that world, I think it would easily be applied to the breeding industry. Because as we've touched on, the amount of clients come into the industry, the less you're going to have that personal connection with or know who they are. So there is a greater risk to fraudulent activity as transactions get larger and more online, it won't be that personal connection. So that ability to sign those people on via KYC, which is another third party, then takes me into to my registered reader home page. Okay, and this is going to take me to my mayor portfolio. And I'm just going to do this very quickly. I'm happy to show anyone for hours how it all works on that. <laughs> but this is a list of all the mayors in my profile. If I wanted to add a mayor, I'm simply looking at Sally Gilman in the front. I would simply be typing, let's put Sally in here. And I would search for a horse with it's a Sally. And I could take her. There she is, of course, 2011. Oomph, pre populated. Now, I'm calling. All that information straight from Aaron. So there's the second connection. So if you use KYC from Andrew's service, I'm pulling all this data automatically from Aaron. You haven't had to enter any of that information as yet. I won't go through the whole process. I'm going to just show you here is one of my existing mares that I've pre populated, um, but very much like the wonderful work that Nick and Angus Digital is. You're uploading imagery. We all know the importance of that file imagery. You've received your free. Um, uh, advanced their pedigree from Arian, so you've got the pedigree, you've got the race record, you've got the sales record, all there at your disposal. The second part of this is the great tool. <coughs> There's a massive uh, disconnection between the owner of the mare, between the agent that might make the uh, recommendation to booking, to the broodmare farm where the actual mare is, and then the stud where the mare actually has to go to. So there's a four-way diamond almost in that communication chain. I figured a way to actually break that all down and make it all seamless. So, in here, I would simply enter myself as the owner here on the screen. I would enter my co owner sitting in the front row. There's other owners in here. I would enter the farm, the brood bear farm manager into here. I would enter Bernard Bloodstock as the agent, and I would enter Sally Gordon as the stud. So, therefore, anything relative to this mayor, I'm now pinging four way communication, and everyone is in the know about what is happening relative to this man. Now, that is all demonstrated here, displayed for you on your reader dashboard. So everything that happens to your mare, or my book follow if I'm on a brood mare farm, is all displayed here on a dashboard. You can add manual notes into it, you can do it a myriad of different things, and, and again, it's all about the data. The second part of breeder, again in this express demonstration, is I want to search for a stadium. I've created a mare profile, I've added a friend, I've added a bloodstock agent, the brood bear farm. I can search for a farm in a myriad of different ways, but I'm going to my signature stadium straight here called Starbucks. 
I search for Starbucks. I look at Starbucks. Let's pretend this is, uh, I can actually look straight into his slot if it was September the 1st, but it's not. I'm going to apply for a nomination. I'm going to choose the mayor who I want to apply for the nom with. And I don't like his advertised price, so I can negotiate. Again, all the things you can normally do on the phone, I'm able to negotiate here. I'm going to say that nom is only worth 8000 this year, and I want a request from Sally if I can have a fault check. Again, negotiating the same things, and I confirm that that is on the proceed. That's a good one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I see. I didn't fill it in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, false, yeah, so I'll not be back. <coughs> okay. And then I can just confirm that. Done. So there is my booking. It's gone from the breeder side across to Studville. Now, just very quickly, I'm going to show you. I'm now playing Sally at Arrowfield, or this show up to the stand at Arrowfield. And there is my automated notification. Sally's out the farm. She's got her note to say, Oof. new booking request has come through to Starbucks. And she is simply clicking on here. This is taking her through to her um, Starbucks stud, her breeder stud profile. And now all Sally is doing is looking at the booking non request that has come through. Now, instead of Sally having to go to the stud book, there's all that data right there for her. Here is all the mayor imagery. Here's the vet reports. Here's the poll imagery. Here's the race performance. Everything else that Sally would have normally gone to four or five different websites is all here on a mobile phone, tablet, which is in the paddock. All she now needs to do is make a decision with the object, wait list to confirm. In this case, that all looks good to me. Starbucks is desperate for a mayor. I'm simply confirming. I'm adding that it's a poll share. Booking is done. Second part for Sally, she gets back to the office and thinks, God, I've got to actually um, find that mayor and slot her in somewhere. So here is H to smoking. We just accepted it. Can everyone see that? All Sally needs to do now is think, okay, well, I'll slot her down there in that afternoon, afternoon cover. Done. So then the second part of Sally, what she needs to do is actually add a contract. You might notice fees, dates, times, everything done. I'm pressing send for e signature. Now, if that was how it started, we'd all be probably branded. This is a free one that we built for the industry to use that don't have contracts. So, in that period of time, she has been able to allocate, generate a contract, follow the contracts, and know that anti smoking is locked in there. And then, very quickly, if I go back to my breeder, I'll. Uh, the breeder that actually made the booking, and I log back in. We go to the dashboard, and we look up here. There it is, already accepted at that price. So everything that's happening at the start end is automatically updated on my dashboard. And previously, I haven't, well, I haven't had to touch a piece of paper, I haven't had to make one phone call, Sally's been able to do it on the run. She's made a more informed and methodical decision related to, relative to that mating than she's ever been able to do. Now, go back to Neil thing. This is the start of where we want to go on this journey. Halfway through this, I would love nothing more than here to have the button to say, let's take this mare onto English Digital and her profile goes boom onto Nick's profile. When I say Nick, I'm referring to English Digital being your own though. And when I'm searching for a stallion, I want to pull up and have a G1G reference on there so you can do a, um, a stallion match um, in the same process. What I'm trying to show is in that process of just something as small as breeder, I've been able to utilise the data and the resources of six other different enterprises in our ecosystem. And I want to grow that further. So that's just how a small thing like breeder can benefit from the growth of everyone else sitting around and how data is going to help us and Bria make the efficiencies that I think are absolute no-brainers for you guys and to make more methodical decisions. And again, there's no need for printed contracts, there's no need for heaps of paper shuffling and any misconceptions about this is going to replace jobs. I'll go back to what Neil said, 
There is no way that this service can replace a good salesman. A good salesman would be following that up to say, just to make sure that you got that followed up, to make sure that you received that booking confirmation. And I've got to show you, as an owner, I've already received that you just have chat, bottle. chat bottle we're doing for us. But the, the great thing is that now you know the, the agent knows, the broodmare farm knows, the owner knows, and the stud knows. And not one phone call has had to be made. It's all follow up now and, and customer service. That's all I wanted to show you on Greeno and follow that up. But again, the importance of that is the way that we integrate with other data services in the industry. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I think, you know, for us as a platform, so we're kind of agnostic to it all, but certainly like talking to our um, clients, um, the ability for easy access. And I think the, the key here is it's easy access, but it's two-way access as well. Like at the moment, you know, um, we kind of treat, you know, a lot of the stuff that comes from the PRAs as a dumb pipe. Um, you know, it comes into the system and it's open for interpretation, but then it doesn't go anywhere. Um, I think, and again, this was kind of my point around we need to, we collectively need to drive it, but also um, we, you know, we need them to come on board as well because it's the, a 360-degree view of data is far more important than a 180-degree view, um, you know. So I think um, any any opportunity where, you know, I almost feel like some of the some of the, the um, gatekeepers kind of almost need to get out of the way. If if you uh, if you could, if I could say that, um, but certainly you know anything where there's a freer flow of data makes you know it actually makes it um, you have to invest in it, right? Because um, data, data availability is one thing. Interpretation of data and use of data in an, in providing an interface for that is kind of where you need to put the money. Um, so I think absolutely, but you know, where does it start? I guess is the the key question. I think for um, for us, if I can jump in, we're we're a little bit different in that um, we are currently we are one of the sources of data we um, which we generate a lot on our own. Uh, but what it would do is it would shift the the direction of where those resources are going. At the moment, we spend, you know, we allocate a lot of resources to manage, to create and manage that data globally. So um, I guess if, if, if we had the opportunity to source that directly from the source and it was accurate and clean as much as it could be, then we would be in a position to direct those resources to an area uh, which potentially could have far more benefits to the end user, uh, you know, yeah, we, we we don't know. We could only guess what that could do, but with you know how everything's moving forward at the moment, um, there could be some really cool stuff created potentially um, if if that was the case. Um, one of the things that I'm always staggered by is our current modelling, and, and I don't know if the audience um, have really sort of sat, had an opportunity to think, but I don't know another industry in the world where our data, the stakeholders, a la the breeders, pay to enter that information into our data bank, which is ultimately the stud book. There's no other industry in the world where they rely on the stakeholders to pay to enter that data, goes into the actual data bank, but then we actually need to pay to extract it. So that modelling is completely wrong. We, it can't be a funnel game. We can't have a lick at it both ways. And the one point I wanted to show you, and I, and I missed it, unfortunately, is I, I, even though that's a criticism, I think it's a way that, you know, I see something like what I just showed you very quickly in Breeder. I know that every time that dashboard is updated, it actually adheres to seven points of the traceability and welfare programs within Racing Australia on their website. So immediately you've cut all that paperwork and all that obligation that Racing Australia and the other governing bodies, and again, it's not a criticism, but they just haven't explored, and I've even offered that data to them to cut that out of the system. So there's a massive way that we can make inroads to traceability and welfare by utilising this existing system. But the way that we're, um, you know, our data funnel, while it's going in like that paid, stays within the bank, takes four months to process, 
we're paying to extract it out. There's not too many industries that can use that data to become more efficient and better if we stay with that model. And I know it's been, and I know the reasons behind, but unless we draw a line in the sand and showcase why products like these and products like you're going to hear about this afternoon, what we could do and the benefits that we could bring, we're not going to go anywhere. So it's vitally important that, you know, we collectively challenge that existing model. And Alan used a lovely term, I think, fertile, it's not a fertile ground for innovation at the moment. And I think the other thing, um, Matthew, that we've all spoken about is the fact that improved data and for what you could potentially provide future people wanting to look to invest in the industry, data's their kryptonite. And so you're somewhat limited, like why don't we recognise that if Matt can do more with his product with greater influx of da to data, stockbrokers or people that are investing into real estate, what do they make all their financial decisions on? Data, data analysis. So why aren't we providing them the kryptonite, not a s s eight week old photocopied page of a pedigree, what Matt put, talked about, the interactive pedigrees, there's nothing, no reason why we can't click on a link and understand where that maiden was actually won. The information's out there. We've got to go back to what Alan was talking about in transparency. We've got to change that whole mindset. Let's give the opportunity to attract new investment by being more transparent and give them the data that they can ultimately go and find, but give it to them right there. And that's the way that we will attract not only new investment, but also more people coming to work for the industry. Go ahead, Matt. Um, what, what I'd just say is, um, you know, I, it, it, I find it really astounding. It's not just the, the you know, Alan referred to the gatekeepers, but um, you know, everyone in that room has probably made a very large decision, you know, if not in the last few weeks with breeding season coming up or, or you know, the last six months. But I'll, I'd invite everyone to ask, themselves um you know what decision what was the largest thoroughbred based decision that they've had to make and think about that and then think about the data that they relied upon in making that decision and i think you know our industry as a whole um is kind of we, we are at this tipping point where we're craving for all types of data um, but we don't actually know what types of data we want and we don't know how to interpret that data for the most meaningful way. Um, so, you know, I think it is the gatekeepers, but I also think that as an industry, um, we need to be willing and open to accepting that um, as, you know, a, a source of truth, if you like, or a part of the process. And, and, and how much of your process individually that becomes, I think, is up to the individual themselves. They might, you know, weight that at 10%. They might... I know people that weight that very, very high and they won't make a decision without the data backing. I know for us, we won't go to a sale, you know, uh, might be a thousand lots, we're, we're down to 30 and then, you know, all of a sudden we're down to 10 and then we give it to, uh, we use Mitchell Bloodstock, we give it to those guys and, you know, they come back with three. Um, so I, that's not the right way. I'm not saying it's the right way or the wrong way. I'm just saying I think as an industry we need to be um, prepared that this shift is coming uh, and we need to be kind of really warm to the idea that it is coming and um, embrace it, really, I think. AB, final question for you. Um, in terms of other devices that you've seen in stable in racing stables, is it GPS tracking? Is it heat sensors? What, what's the newest technology that the racing stables are using to improve identification of workload in horses, minimising injury of, to um, risk of injury, et cetera? Yeah, so talking to uh, – like, so we've got integrations with eTracker um, and a French company called Ariano. Um those ones kind of look a lot more at performance. So, you know, stride, length, heart rate, et cetera. Um, there's a couple of others that are kind of doing similar things, um, uh, which are still kind of, whether you like it or not, they were, the, the, the RVL were using it as part of their um, uh, Melbourne Cup, you know, um, quarantine process. Um, and it's really around saddle cloth. Um, it's essentially sensors in the saddle cloth. Um, 
and they're, they're taking all the typical measurements, but they're actually using data on that individual horse to to so they'll take a whole heap of um, measurements over you know a course of time, and then it'll actually be able to predict if there are changes in that gait or that stride length or whatever that would be cause for concern. So even in that kind of really minutia of um, you know wearables that is actually looking to use machine learning. Um, this is separate to all the racing data. This is just, you know, behind the scenes, um, uh, you know, saddle cloths that, that are basically using machine learning to predict, you know, whether a, a change in action of the horse is going to lead to a negative outcome. Um, they're the type of ones that I know, you know, the PRAs are certainly looking at. Um, they're the ones that, you know, I think from a welfare perspective um, will become much more prevalent in the next sort of 12 to 18 months. Um, and I think that also applies, you know, not as to the extreme, but also in the breeding space where, you know, you, you are going to want an ongoing management of, you know, horses out in the paddock, um, you know, and any anything where you can pick up sensory data, um, it can be interpreted by, you know, computers, as Matt said, much smarter than us, um, or pick up nuances that actually can um, prevent um, any injury or um, future health concerns. Um, I think that'll be kind of that next frontier. The the thing around performance is there's a lot of people already playing in the space, but it's kind of how do you get to that preventative um, welfare management? Because you know, as I alluded to before, the the welfare groups and the the, the social license and the the um, the noise outside of the industry is not going to get any quieter. You know, um, so we need to start thinking about how do you actually you know counteract that because they obviously don't listen to reason. Um, but there are significant concerns in there, and it's been you know, shown in the past that you know, there are gaps in the way we manage the welfare of horses, both during racing and, um, and uh, post-racing. Um, so they're legitimate concerns, but I think you know, the technology is there to help, one, the welfare side, and two, the tracking side. Um, it just takes that impetus of the industry to kind of get behind it and, and really push it forward. Um, whether it's us or, you know, the PRAs, um, it, it's just something that needs to happen. <laughs> Thank you both very much for your time and insight. Um, Matt, great to see you, AB. Thank you for that Route 1 Gold Mine and Prism. Very much appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, this will mean something to most and nothing to others. So this is just the lead in to new technology and what we're trying to do is showcase old normal and new normal. So there will literally be someone in the room that this means nothing to, which to me I find pretty entertaining. And if we hit the next slide because I don't have a buzzer and watch this video, I think it speaks to itself. Oh my God. Give me a demonstration on how to listen to a tape. <laughs> Oz, where do you put the um, headphones? In there. No, you put it into a TV. You didn't have TVs back in those days. <laughs> what, when I was a child? Yeah. yeah. In the 80s, there weren't any TVs? No. no. You're just old. B. Are you getting any music out of it, Oz? No. I'm just getting rattles. You're just getting rattles? Yeah, how do you turn it on? Is do it you like think it needs button? batteries? Yeah. Where do you think the batteries might go? How do you turn it on? How do, do you, you turn like, it on? Yeah. Is there a switch? I broke it. I broke it. Just push it back in. Right. Is that like... <laughs> oh, I found I really where you put the headphones. I really don't understand how you listen to music on this thing. I found where, you, right. put, I found where you put the headphones. Daddy, I know how you use them. You put them oh, in the Oh, yeah, you can TV. watch the music video through there. <laughs> so you, you plug your headphones in there. I get it, and right, 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 right. And then it goes through it, and right, then no, the music no, no, video no, no. goes ahead. You plug it into like this. So basically, somehow it plugs into like the TV, and you have to watch it through there. Yeah. Or Is there an in. AUX cable that goes into the uh, TV? Are you guys actually serious? I'm deadly serious. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you see? Here's the wire. 
worst music ever. We're trying to work out how you listen to the music on a tape, please. <laughs> I know how. <laughs> Is it that just gives you an idea. Sometimes I feel like that's what I'm doing when I'm speaking to the stud book, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, just reinforcing what is new technology versus old technology is always evolving. And on that, we're going to invite Andrew Jarvis to talk to us about his um, great platform called Workplace Digital, um, which is helping a lot of stables and studs and farms on the on onboarding of staff and making that whole process seamless. And Andrew has actually had a lot of experience um, with data and uh, both on the racing and breeding side and CRM programs. So he might be able to speak to all of that and is a very knowledgeable resource in the industry. So welcome, Andrew. If you'd like to come up and just give us a recap on um, Workplace Digital and the new technology that you're providing. Oh, thank you, Tom. Um, yeah, as Tom said, uh, we do focus on employment. Um, so basically, we, we started a few years ago focusing on automation of both employees, so everything for around you know, promoting a job, receiving an applicant, right through to onboarding a new staff member and getting all the contracts up until their first day. But it's also about onboarding customers as well, um, collecting the right information about customers, giving them a great first experience, um, automating some email and content flows. Um, uh, and it's around it, whether you're um, buying a racehorse for the first time or a stallion nomination, what is the important information to share with that new customer or that new staff member for that matter? Uh, we don't you know, dive into the oh &S side of things or the learning and management tools, but up until that first day is very critical. But it's also about mis uh, risk management. So from a customer point of view, it's collecting that right information about their identity, verifying that they exist and they are who they say they are and they live where they say they live. So this term is called KYC, know your customer. Um, other industries, especially wagering, gaming, most of us might have betting accounts, we've probably all gone through that at some point. Um, financial services industry. Um, those industries are compelled, actually, to uh, verify the identity and the bona fides of each new customer. Um, as I, as I mentioned, if you have to uh, send debt collectors around to someone, you want to make sure that that person's address is accurate. Uh, it's very, very difficult to perform any debt collection processes unless you've got all, the, all that information in place. Um, but it's equally about uh, performing some due diligence. And by that I mean for a customer, and let's say you've got a new customer uh, to your stud um, and they're signing up for a contract, you know, spending big money, there is some due diligence processes that you can put in place that our platform provides that goes and checks various fraudulent activity watch lists, Interpol, money laundering watch lists. Um, not so much police checks, but there's various other data sources that governments around the world provide that allows you to do some fundamental checks to decide whether or not you want to accept them as a customer. Provides you a little bit more information to decide you know, whether you want to accept them as a customer. If you don't, you can go through some you know, further checks or further investigations such as credit history and, and the like. So that's sort of where we're headed, um, pro providing all of those tools to not only collect the right information, but check that you're happy with that customer in your business. Um, the, how we do that is this point here really is a customer relationship management system. Nothing innovative about that. It's been around for years. It's probably underutilized um, in our industry because it provides a lot of information, sorry, a lot of capability to capture more information about each customer and each employee for that matter and automating the steps that are required to onboard a new customer or a new employee. So think of um, an inquiry on a stallion. Uh, a CRM platform can trigger some automatic internal notifications, maybe an e email back to that person who's inquired on that stallion. Maybe there's a follow-up email three days later around statistics or about the farm history or whatever it might be. The ability to craft that engagement with a new customer is quite powerful. And imagine, learning from what we heard earlier from Neil, incorporating AI into that eventually so that your content or the information that you're providing is a lot more valuable, it's short and sharp, not waffly, all those kind of things that we learned from Neil earlier is where we're headed to bring into um, this, call it marketing, 
Um, but it's not really outbound marketing, it's what, what's termed inbound marketing. You know, what happens when you get a new sales lead or a new candidate for a job? You know, how can we use systems to automate that information flow and that onboarding process? Um, yeah, and the KYC bit, bit um, if, if anyone's looked into this, does, is, is anyone aware of what KYC is? Have you encountered that before? Yeah, so I think we've all gone through it. You can actually subscribe to one of these um, services and do your own checks on a new customer, but it requires logging in and punching in their details and doing all that manually. Whereas automating all of that and then feeding that new customer and or that new employee into the systems that you use every day, such as Prism, Breeder, maybe Ardex in the future, whatever it might be, and automating that entire workflow so that your accounts are set up, your communications systems are set up, your marketing systems are set up um, with no manual effort. Um, and obviously giving you some confidence um, that you're going to do your best to reduce fraud, reduce the risk of money laundering. Um, licensed racehorse syndicators, um, got, got quite a few clients, uh, that they are, they are compelled to follow this KYC process, ASIC compels them to do that. A lot of syndicators don't do it, but in our opinion, our biased opinion, any organisation that is dealing with large sums of money probably should consider going down this path as well and, and doing that due diligence and, and not only protecting your own business, but in a way, I think, protecting the industry's reputation. You know, we all suffer if we welcome an unsavoury client um, and it makes the news or whatever it is and it has happened from time to time. Really, after we've taken their money. Yeah, after we've taken the money, correct, yeah. So it's a, it's a balancing act. Um, uh, but, but that also leads to, my, leads to my next point, Tom, is there's a flip side. You don't want to make it too cumbersome for your new customer or new employees either. So we've really tried to focus and work with various clients to make that process as smooth as possible, taking the paper out of the paperwork, no paperwork whatsoever, um, allowing a customer to verify themselves anytime anywhere on any device in like 30 seconds. Um, there's a whole uh, layer of options that are available to us in the future. Um, other industries are going down the biometric uh, checks where you have to take a photo of yourself that matches your driver's license number and, and proves that you're in person and you exist and you're alive and all those kind of things. We're certainly not heading down that path yet, but maybe at some point, um, we can offer a whole bunch of solutions um, depending on your risk profile, depending on how risky you are perceiving your new clients. As we welcome new clients into our industry, what, what steps do you want to take before you accept them? Um, yeah, so that, that's pretty much where we're at at the moment. Employee onboarding, customer onboarding, with the KYC options as well, and automating that entire process and connecting with other systems as well. Um, Tom mentioned Breeder, but yeah, we've got a good uh, partnership with Prism. So all of those processes ultimately end up a new employee and a new customer landing in Prism. No one's had to enter their details at all. They're ready for billing. It's all seamless and, and verified. Cool. Um, thank you, Andrew. Um, we might just get you to take a seat and we'll throw to our second uh, guest who is Emma Wyville and she's got a great website and Emma being pregnant with you can sit straight down um, I really encourage you in each of these demonstrations to go onto the individual websites and have a look but some of the content that Emma has created uh, she is the face of it so I'm, I'm going to give you all the kudos for creating it um, is doing an amazing job and we've spoken about the onboarding process and education and creating those ease of pathways for when we can finally attract new people to the industry. Let's make it easy, let's educate them. And I know Cecilia and the TBA have done a mighty job on doing that. And so I congratulate you on those initiatives as well. Um, but Emma, if you could give us some insight into your wonderful new technology. Currently, uh, the company is called Horse Fitness. We have, um, we're not delivering the product at the moment. We're still seeking funding and investors. Uh, there are three educational platforms that are specific to the three targeted uh, industries, so breeding, racing, and equestrian. 
Um, these platforms will function as a tool on your mobile phone for staff as they enter or prior if you need them to, so that it is a form of communication that um, bridges the gap that we've got between all of us who've been in the industry for a really long time and we can all do really hard work and deal with abrupt communication styles, but the new kids coming through can't. They don't, they don't work like that and they go home. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, and they don't usually last for very long. So our current staff are very tired. Training people is really hard to do and it takes quite a lot of compassion and time and consideration and it's usually done on an individual basis and we've all got different learning styles. So these platforms cater to all those different learning styles, whether you like to nerd out prior to starting a job or if you like to learn something and then try it when you're on the job, or if you like to just repeatedly learn things, if you can't read and write, it's all spoken, it's all in video, and there's backing up documentation for everything, and it's specific to the industry that you're coming into. So the, the purpose of this is not to take away from the amazing knowledge base that is on a stud farm or at a racing stable. It's to get the people that are coming through to reach a bottom bar of, um, knowledge that we used to have automatically from people being in the racing industry all their lives or if they were equestrians coming through and they could all have basic good handling and husbandry skills. That's not really what we get anymore. Um, we're lucky if we get backpackers. We're lucky if we get people who speak English. We definitely don't really get the equestrians anymore because they won't, to be fair, work that hard or be spoken to in the way that they are when they come in. Um, so it's to raise our bottom bar a little bit higher and get everyone up to speed in the best, most positive way to give new people that are coming in a really great experience and love what we have to offer because it is a wonderful uh, industry for people to come in and excel in. But this initial introduction that we currently have going on is not working for us. And so this is the solution that we want to offer to those kids coming through and those people from other countries. Um, so yeah, that's cool. So yeah, uh, Tom wanted to know what we're doing 2030. <laughs> um, the goal would be to service 50,000 plus users across the three brands. Uh, we plan on offering RTO courses through the platforms. There's plans for a Greyhound and Standard Bread expansion in Australia and uh, international launch hopefully to four targeted markets. Um, that we've sort of pinpointed as, as what would be uh, great expansion points for us. Um, the positives for horse fitness getting off the ground and everyone utilising it is, especially with the equestrian platform, the goal there is to actually have marketing capacity to the people who are using it as equestrians to see what an amazing employment space we actually have to offer. Uh, young girls who are horse mad get told when they're growing up at school, find something that you love and you never work a day in your life. They love horses. If someone's not from the racing industry, the common uh, comment that they will receive is, you can't make money unless you're a jockey. Find something else, make some money and then buy some horses and have that. It's not true, you can make money in here. It's a bit of hard work, but you can do it. So I want to showcase everything that the thoroughbred industry has to offer to these mad, passionate girls and boys so that they have, Australia especially, has a reliable in, um, incoming of workers that are based in Australia because I think COVID highlighted our extreme reliance on migrant workers and we were really struggling and we not, haven't really recovered either. Um, by lifting sort of the knowledge base of hands-on work with horses, you're absolutely going to improve the welfare of the animal and the staff as well, which would be great. By sort of waking up our equestrian allies to everything that we do in the thoroughbred space, we kind of, we can mobilise a very loud and opinionated army to do a lot of the work that we can't actually do because we do tend to sort of stay in our bubble because we're working really hard. We, we don't have the extended networks that they do have to access. 
I don't know if many of you have been to horse, uh, been to sort of parties where there's a mad horse girl that doesn't work in there, but she's very loud, she's very opinionated, and she usually doesn't stop talking about horses and how amazing they are. So utilising them and their voice and their networks to change the perspective of what we do is going to make a massive impact on the public perception that we all want to be far more positive than what it is now. Um, part of what we're going to do is continued education, which um, there are really great initiatives that are going on, but not everyone has access to them or not all facilities have the capacity to send their staff off to go and be part of the courses that there are. So continuing education through um, the platforms, typically through podcasts. Uh, it's so that people can learn what the industry has to offer once you move from sort of base level up middle management where you can go later on if your body's not coping with the more physical work. So hopefully we can keep people within the industry instead of losing them to others. Um, by providing a trainer, a virtual trainer to businesses, it relieves the business's cost of having to have one themselves. It allows the staff that do have to do a job they're not really hired to do, to do the one that they are able to do, which increases everybody's productivity. So in the long run, it becomes very cost effective for businesses. So my perception is that I want to be at the racetrack in 10 years' time. I hope I'm not stealing your thunder, but I'm just trying to set the scene. That if I have an ownership, my 5% share in a filly that's about to jump, and I get an offer by my phone for 150000 for that 5% share, and I don't think that she's got a chance of running a drum in that race. Why can't I sell that 5% boomf and it go to Paul Massara and bing on our phone via blockchain, that deal is done. Racing Australia knows who I am, they know who Paul Massara is, they know who the horse is. So all the traditional ingredients of a sale are there. We don't need to go via this convoluted way of taking six weeks to change a registration, pay that in, come out, all the paperwork, blah, blah, blah. That's what really excites me about BTX. Because I think, yes, other models are doing micro shares, but it's the blockchain side of ownership that'll encourage people and they'll start playing, like it'll become a commodity. And that's when you'll see people engaged on a racetrack going, okay, well, I've got this share, I own a horse, what's it worth, do I trade it? It's, it comes to its own share market. Hope I'm not stealing your thunder, I love it. Take it away, please. And I, I definitely won't try and explain the blockchain to you. Um, I think. As a business, we sit there and say, how much do you need to know about the underlying technology that's in place? How much do we know how Adobe works? How do we know Generative AI works? We go to Microsoft, we go to Google, and we say, plug in and chat GPT and, and those things. So it's, you know, from, from an enterprise, just to baseline your understanding of blockchain, what we're really talking about is a decentralized distributed ledger. Right? And that's a ledger of information. So it could be a digital passport, it could have medical certificates, medical records, it could be the ownership records. It's just a, a single source of truth which is shared between people at a point in time, which comes to that immediacy of the transaction layer. And when you combine that record with automation on the back end, you can actually get those that instantaneous transactional single source of truth. So I'll, un I'll unpack that a little bit as to where we're going. But, but as Tom says, from, from BTX's point of view, we're a technology company, we're not a horse company. We, we came to it from the technology side. We came from it recognising the power of blockchain as a future enterprise technology capability in the equine industry. Why did we come to the equine industry? Gen general love of horses, general love of sport, um, but really decentralised data decentralised information, multiple owners, trainer, multiple suppliers, you know, horses traded all the time through those significant paperwork. All of those things are perfect use cases for the blockchain to solve. So you know, where we started as a technology company was really around the ownership model, 
and yeah, trying to solve the problem of affordability and accessibility to the industry. Mm -hmm. So when we think about the opportunities, we think about a marketplace and we think about the supply side and the demand side. And a lot of people in this room are on the supply side. What we're trying to do is unlock and create the demand side. So if you look at number of racehorse owners in Australia, 100 depends, a bit of duplication between true owners and syndicate members, but 120, 140,000 owners. We did a survey market study there's 2.2 million Australians would like to own a racehorse, seven out of nine. There's 38% that would say never own a racehorse, licensed to operate issues welfare. But 2.2 million Australians would like to own a racehorse, seven out of nine on a rating scale, if it was affordable. So that's a huge market. You're going from 120, 140,000 people to potentially 2 million. Why aren't they in the industry? Yeah, they can't afford it. It's not accessible. It's too hard to buy. You need to know a trainer. How do you go about it? Right? So, so what we're doing is really democratising the, the purchase capability of those. So you know, because of the digitised ledger, it's really efficient for us. So if I said to you, hey, you can go and sell your racehorse, but you've got to go sell it to 1,000 people or 10,000 people, the paperwork would just kill you, so you don't. Right? So that pushes the price up. Right? So if you can deal with that automation and that paperwork efficiently, which blockchain does, you can sell it to a million people just as easily as one person. Right, which brings the price down. So that's, that's what the technology is enabling. We've done that in racehorses. We're now moving into the breeding industry. Mm. So we released a breeding pack um, a month ago. So that breeding pack, just to give you a sense of the economics and how it works. So that was done with Blue Gum Farm, which is backed by Trilogy, who's an investor in BTX. Um, but what that is, is basically, we've taken a 10% share in five broodmares, um, pregnant, and in foal, and we're selling people a right to that foal, 10% interest in that foal that will be sold at auction, and then next year's foal as well. So they're gonna go through the breeding experience, which has previously been inaccessible to general people that like the racing industry. So the pricing of all that, we've sold that into a thousand people. So a thousand people own 10%, it's only small, but they're getting the experience, they're getting the insight, they're getting the, the journey as well. And that costs 300 bucks. So for 300 bucks, you're getting access to 10 foals, basically, fingers crossed. Um, but five broodmares, they're going through that journey. They'll go through the nomination process. We can build community around that. So it's just a different buying experience. As Tom said, where are we going? You know, fundamentally, the technology is far more powerful and capable than legal and regulatory processes of today. So we spend about 80% of our time actually trying to work through the current regulatory environment and the current legal environment to actually do what the technology can do. So we can do own for a race, we can do own for a day, we can access global markets. So you know, the opportunity, Australia is really well placed as a strong thoroughbred country, racing country, breeding country. So if we can actually get to a global marketplace, Australia will, will do really, really well and that's a huge channel. But I can take, just to give you an idea of the power of the capability, whether you do this or you wouldn't do this, I could take my $300 breeding share, right, as, a, as, a, as an owner, I can then split that into another 30 with my mates if I really want, right, it's efficient enough, and then one of my mates could take that and put that onto OpenSea, which is a global blockchain marketplace, and somebody in the UK could buy that for, yeah, three bucks, two bucks. Right? That's the power of the technology. I can't do that at the moment because it's a financial product, it's regulated, so I have to go through all of those regulatory processing requirements, but that's where the industry is going. As soon as the regulators get comfortable in the technology construct and transparency that it brings, they may relax the 20 owner rule, they may relax some of the other things, and then that'll open up true ownership which allows you to go down to, to multiple levels. So, so that's kind of the, the baseline. Just to think about the opportunities for you, and this is where the technology's going, Tom, for us, right? A couple of things. Yeah, what you sell at the moment is the horse, what you sell is the foal, what you sell is a racehorse, right? In the digital world, you, you can fractionalize that. You can break that into component parts, right? And you can sell it earlier than you, you can in a physical world. Right? Because what you're doing is whatever entitlement to prize money, breeding proceeds, digital rights, you're just putting a digital layer over the top. It's no different to a share. Right? You, own a, you own a share in BHP, you don't actually own BHP, you don't know the mine, you don't touch the mine. So you're just creating a share layer for whatever entitlement that you want to attach to it. 
So what does that mean? What does that unlock? Right, you're sitting at the auction, your mare goes really well, the foal gets sold, great price. Suddenly you could take 10% of next year's foal or next five years foal, wrap it into a digital layer and then you can actually sell the digital token, right? Then that digital token can be traded, right? That's where you're actually going in terms of the power of the technology. That can bring you forward your capital flows all the way to today because when you're actually dealing with more people in smaller increments, there's not the financing challenges. We collect all funds up front. So you know, Blue, Blue Gum has actually taken their share of those funds for the next two years on that 10% today because the consumers have paid their 300 bucks and paid next year's covering fees and those types of things. So it's a, it's a capital working capital management opportunity as well. Um, that's one opportunity. The other one which is huge, which is coming, and this comes to the next generation, this whole, I don't understand, I'm too old for it, it's a bit like your cassette, I got that, <laughs> right? Um, gamification, right? So the next generation, they love the gaming, they love the tradability, they love the digital, they love the virtual, right? So in a blockchain world, you can create a digital twin of your horse that will go and play in a gaming type environment. Who owns that digital twin? No one at the moment, right? The, the regulator owns the stud book, they own the physical, who, who actually owns the digital copy of it. Now, it costs about a cent to mint that token. Right, so yeah, you've got your Z runs, you've got your silks, you've got other environments that are coming up. If you, if you could create a digital twin and then that digital twin carries forward across the life of the horse or whatever, you know, people can actually game off the back of that. So you know, you've got revenue streams opening up to the assets that you look at, whether it's you know, pre-selling breeding rights and opportunities, racing rights, you can separate the assets into two ownership groups and you can create this digital twin type construct. So, Pretty, pretty powerful opportunities that sit there. The other thing that is very much on our roadmap, we haven't done yet because, yeah, I think it's an industry issue and it's going to require some cooperation. Um, but in terms of the technology, the superpower of this technology is what you're actually creating is a ledger, a digital record for every horse efficiently. You tokenize the horse, right? Now, we've tokenized the horses that are on our platform. You wouldn't know it. We've taken that token and we've split it into a thousand yeah, copies of that token and people have the entitlement to that token, right? But if you tokenize the horse, yeah, you can actually yeah, put the pregnancy scan that stays with that token that goes with the life of the foal from cradle to grave, right? You can actually yeah, put, put, yeah, we get a bit of pushback from the industry around this, significant medical information records, yeah, but, but if you want to be the best breeder and responsible and sustainable breeding and all those things, that, that might be a competitive advantage if you're confident in your product and those types of things, right? What we can actually get to very, very quickly, right, is self-managed super fund for every horse, right? Because it's efficient. It's an efficient accounting system. It just yeah, whether you want to clip the ticket and who pays and who contributes doesn't matter. But from cradle to grave, you can have a self-managed fund, self-managed super fund token that will stay with that horse through the life of life of the cycle, right to retirement, right to paying food costs, all those type of things. What's the challenge with that? It's not the technology. The technology is easy. It's who wants to pay for it? What's the regulatory process? How do you administer the pools of capital that will go with the horses? They're, they're solvable problems, but they're not technology problems. They're commercial industry-based problems, but that's the opportunity that's in front of us. So I think the other thing just in terms of application we're starting to do is really start to think about your customers in as a community and how do you actually want to connect with those customers in that community. So, so we've just done a, a, a membership token in Queensland. We were talking about the, the race club. You, know, you can tokenise your membership. You can tokenise your customer base. What does that mean? It gives someone a digital forum that you can start to attach value to that token. That could be tradable. Yeah, that could be content-based, it could be community-based, it could be access to farm visits, those types of things, right? You can attach physical benefits to a digital entitlement, which people can then buy and sell in a secondary market. So pretty exciting, but lots to, lots to take in. Pretty Pretty exciting though. Yeah. Um, and, you know, again, you go back to the common thread of all three, um, it's on the regulatory side where 
there is still cloud in this ambiguity around where to go. I mean, I know Andrew for a long, and I'll just give you an example because I just want you to understand. What, and again, I go back, these guys have done all this off their own back. No support, no government funding, et cetera, et cetera. But I know, and I don't mean to out you, Andrew, but you sent me an email saying, here is a list, where do I go? He tried to get clarification on whether, on the KYC side of stuff, a digital signature, which is pretty mainstream. Now, will Racing Australia accept a digital signature as part of a syndicator's ownership? And I said, oh, we'll just bang it through, here's another address, try this. And he said, no, have a look at the email trail. Five since, anyway, to cut a long story short, five or six emails into Racing Australia asking the most basic question to enable him to go forward with new technology, to do better things, to try and help us all, zero responses. Similarly, a little guidance on BTX, where do they go? What, what is that government? You know, I know those discussions are happening in other industries. Now, it may well be happening in Druitt Street, it may be happening in Racing Australia, it may be happening you know, behind the scenes. But what we're really poor as an industry is being transparent and communicating that. So if, if whether Anthony knew that, yeah, we're working on this, Anthony, hold five, we'll come back to you. That's a very different response to, I just won't respond to it, or I'll just let you wait, Andrew, I don't know. And I know that Emma finds the same difficulty in asking questions or looking for support. There's just nowhere to go. And so... Again, I drive back, why are we doing this here today? Because we want to hear the stories about what's out there, new initiatives, people coming at the industry for, from all different directions doing really exciting things, but we keep on hitting glass ceilings. And if we stand there, again, nothing's going to change. It's not going to change overnight. We all know where the issues are, but we, if we have a broader understanding about the common issues, we've got a far better chance at continually asking the questions and driving some change. And is there anything, like, I, I didn't mean to sort of steal the thunder there from the panel side of things, but I think also what I saw with, um, from a BTX perspective, again, utilising other people, like, you know, KYC to help you on board, and with content, you know, whether there was other opportunities to bring other people in the industry in. And I don't know, I mean, I know you've done a fantastic initiative with Bluegum, but I could see Matt Comerford's mind saying, why aren't we doing this with Whitten? Are there other, are there, are you open to other studs doing something similar? Yeah, we're, a, we're a platform, we're, we're an ecosystem play for the entire industry. And I mean, ultimately what we're trying to do is create a marketplace that people on the supply side can access in the way they want to access. And you, know, you might want to do it commercially differently to blue gum and things would appeal, but we're, we're, we're open, we're not tied. Um, they've just jumped at us first. Um, so I think yeah, our view on that is one of the things we're trying to do is we're really trying to attract global liquidity pools into the industry. And, and if you think about Bitcoin, whether you, anyone's got Bitcoin or not, um, this huge amount of trapped liquidity in Ether, in Bitcoins, we've got crypto payment rails. So if you bring that into the breeding side of the industry, even attracting self-managed super fund money. So we've, we've got a financial product. Um, it's ASIC reg regulated. Um, there's no reason that a super fund can't actually come in once we demonstrate the returns on this alternate investment class. Right? So we're trying to actually build a marketplace that can actually, yeah, and, we, and we're, not, we're not agnostic. We're agnostic because on the racing side, we, we've got relationships with Kieran, with Gay, with Will Clarkin, with the Freemans, yeah, with Annabelle. So you know, we are a marketplace. We're a platform. That's our business. So and you're a very gay man in, um, mentioning super funds in the same line as uh, racing, if um, yeah. those older teams will be out here. But yeah, we, we understand and distinguish maybe a little bit that the, the returns in breeding are very different and a little bit more predictable, a little bit safer maybe than racing, right? So, And I suppose throwing to Andrew and Emma, like again, you're both on the onboarding side of things. Um, is there anything, you know, that we can do to the audience here that we can assist um, you're, or you know, similarly that you found to try and engage younger people to come into the industry. Is there anything in particular that you've noticed and feedback you get that these guys can take away to help um, onboarding future staff, um, especially into the breeding industry? I think it's been mentioned 
mentioned earlier, um, as well, let, me, let me go back one step. Sometimes innovation is not the answer. Sometimes adoption is. Adoption of technology and and providing uh, employees the chance to learn new te the technologies, get on board, you know, follow that journey, um, develop their careers, and and um, I think we all see a case where we're losing the opportunity to attract new, uh, young people or young, younger generation into our industry because they're going elsewhere. Um, they're going to the, the fintech or they're going to agriculture more broadly, whatever it might be. So that career development, the tech competencies is, needs to be important. Um, you know, I, on the training side of it, if I can uh, make a comment but what I see on trainers, because I'm not working. Um, a lot of trainers that I see, uh, you know, small businesses, they're actually hiring people like themselves. You know, hiring people like themselves in bloodstock or marketing, um, rather than hiring someone different. Rather than hiring someone with a bit of technical competency or ability to learn new systems or implement or challenge the status quo. And I think as an industry that affects us all because we're not seen as a preferred employer. Um, so that's just some general observations that I see that technology can play a part to, to attract more people. And Emma, like you touched on the equine world, is there, are there things that we could do better to um, create those silos to bring um, you know, the young girls of today that you refer to? Um, and please go ahead, I've got another thought that I'll I can. We've got some really great initiatives that are coming through from quite a lot of the PRAs to the equestrian community, principally on prize money, which is great because there's usually none of that. Um, but I think um, we need to focus a bit more. Obviously, I've created a company to do that. But on the from the bottom up, instead of just coming from the top down, um, I think that we are not great at communicating and um, creating a really enjoyable experience um, for these kids and I think that that's going to be the key to making sure that they keep coming through because um, ensuring that they have a really positive time is paramount to them where it didn't used to be for us. Um, so I think that that's a part of the industry that need, like, needs to really be focused on is from the bottom up, not so much from the top down. Um, one of the other things that, I mean, this is a bit more holistic, but when you look at the number of, I think, young people in the equestrian environment are a great uh, pool for us to try and tap into. But I also believe, and um, Anthony touched on it, that if you just look at the racing industry, the funnels to take people from the racing experience into the breeding industry is nothing but roadblocks and brick walls. I reckon we can really easily break those down by utilising innovation. In the, let's say, I think there's 35,000 horses at the moment registered running around. If we cut that in half, seven and a half thousand are gonna be fillies. And let's just use for the sake of the argument that those fillies then come across at the end of their racing career into the breeding industry. If on average, every one of those seven and a half have a minimum of two. I don't know what silly the average horse has 2.5 owners, maybe more, I don't know. Let's say this, so there's another 30,000 registered people involved in a filly. Now at the other end, on the breeding industry, we have 4,000 registered breeders. So there is a massive gap disproportionate of the registered breeders that are playing in the game to those that have emotional attachment for the life of the filly on the racetrack. Now, I think we could, if we could create an easier funnel for people that are already emotionally attached to that filly in the racing career, when she hits five to say, would you, you've had so much enjoyment with that filly on the track, you love that horse, you go to watch every week, you've seen her at the stables, would you like to continue or we provide the facilitation for you to continue and take her into the breeding industry? I think we would just organically, you know, you only take 10% of that and all of a sudden we're up to the, you know, another, an extra thousand breeders into the game. And we all know once you've had the breeding itch, where that goes. You don't stop there, you're intrigued, you're looking at pedigrees, you want to grow more, more investment, bring your mates in, you can't afford it, so you bring more mates in, then you bring your family. Um, we all know how bad that goes. Um, but I think there again, I, you know, I've been in the game now long enough, I haven't seen, read or heard 
anything from the racing side and the breeding community going, hold on, how do we join those dots together? I know we're fractured in what we do, but at some stage, sure, we go, okay, well, there's the easy part. We've got equestrian and we've got all those people that have already got the touch point onto horses and got the love of it. And we've got this amazing pool of people. It's, no other industry has that. It's a free kick for us. They're already sitting there in the racing industry. Don't make them go and fill in forms. Make that, we already know, again, who they are. Horses got a microchip. We know they're aligned to it. Make that process across into the breeding industry bloody easy. And we can use technology like this to encourage that and make that transition. Um, and I think that's another just point that, you know, annoy sort of keeps me awake at night and just looking for further opportunities that I don't feel like we've had a really red hot crack at or got the support from the governing bodies to be able to facilitate it. So um, is there any other questions while we've got these unique minds and, and guys again they've done fantastic efforts in your um, efforts to get your respective technology up and going and you know hopefully after this, you can go and ask individual questions. I encourage you to look on their individual websites, reach out to them. And again, we go back to that common goal. We're all here with one objective and that's to try and improve your day to day. So I'm sure everyone would enjoy having that dialogue. And I even know that as of today, you know, there's a lot of um, synergies between what Andrew and Emma are doing, already having discussions. So it's a massive tick of what we're doing today is exposing those new products and people working together. But um, without any other questions, I'll say thank you very much for your time and let's all go forth together. Thank you. Um, the great thing about this room, it works like the shrine of remembrance in Melbourne. Um, the sunlight comes through there at about 234, which renders this hopeless, and that's the end of my waffle. Next, we're going to, I'm going to get kicked off here because it's the almighty Dr. Christine Chigan from the AgriFood. Um, I was really fascinated, um, again, sort of been in the, in the game for a little while. I never knew about AgriFutures. And when I did, I discovered it last week for the first time. I was like, wow, what a really impressive group. And it gave me an understanding of where our industry funding is going to which I'd previously had no insight to. So I was really grateful that Catherine, who heads up the chair of looking after the panel who decide where all our industry levies goes, was able to come here today and give you, the other stakeholders who provide the levies that enable Catherine to make decisions to then AgriFutures to then uh, dedicate that funding elsewhere uh, to be able to do what they do. So. Over to you, Chuck. Thanks, Tom. Please. Thank you. Um, so, I'd just like to ask how many of you have heard of the Thoroughbred program with AgriFutures? Okay. How many of you understand that it's your levies that pay for the investment in our DNA that AgriFutures directs? Okay, so, so it's interesting because that's at least good to see, you know, half the hands in the room go up. And I think Tom's comment about, you know, getting. Uh, just purchase with industry stakeholders. I think we've worked very hard at that. This program now, as in its current form, has been um, with AgriFutures for the last six years. So AgriFutures is the rebranded old RARDC, RUDIC. And um, what is it or who are they? It is a, um, an organisation that's an RDC in its own right. So lots of industry, agricultural industries have research development corporations of their own, from the Grain RDC to the Wool RDC and various others. This is an RDC that works under the PERD Act, the Primary Industries Research Development Act, and it basically administers and um, represents all the research needs for 13 of the industries that are up there on that list. So large industries, small industries, emerging industries, chicken, meat, rice, honeybees, Thoroughbred horses is in there. Then you get down to things like kangaroo, buffalo, ratites, and all sorts of other smaller industries. And they also look at emerging industries, which are not yet levied, trying to get them to a stage in their life cycle that they can actually support an industry levy. So you all contribute to this as stakeholders in the industry, and particularly in, it, it is a, 
a levy on breeding. And I think that's something that's really important to understand. The previous horses program with Rodec was across all equine pursuits. So the equine industry, which is an industry, interesting term in itself because I don't believe there is an equine industry, there are a whole lot of disparate groups of people who utilise horses for different things. And I think we are all at a stage where we're in, utilising any animals in agriculture or for whatever pursuit we're using them, where we are very much more answerable to society. Society is changing in what they think about humans utilising animals for anything. So whether we are a horse industry utilising breeding horses for racing and pursuit of entertainment and gaming, or whether we are breeding feedlot cattle for people to eat and provide protein for people to eat, we are being scrutinised more than we ever have been in every sector of agriculture. I don't think that's different for any agricultural pursuit. We have to be mindful of that. We very much as an as an organised, as an industry, a thorough, particularly a thorough industry, we tend to operate in a bubble. A lot of the people who are in it have been in it for a long time, and I thought it was really interesting saying we, try, we need to try and get new people in, people who perhaps don't see it as a normal pathway for them to come in and, and show, we have to showcase what is available. And that with all the technology and all the differences that are occurring in this industry now, we basically have so many opportunities to draw different people in. There's, and, and that is the same for agriculture across the board. But we are not unique in that and we have lots of opportunities to pull people in. And the industry have been doing a lot in that space, which is really great to see. So just a quick summary of your levy. The thoroughbred horses levy um, was introduced in September 2017 and that's when the, when the panel started. So $10 for every mare return paid by the mare owner and $10 for every mare served paid by the stallion owner for each return. So whether a foal is produced or not, basically, that union, that mating, basically generates $20 per um, event, which goes into an RD&E um, pot, basically, for you, administered through AgriFutures. So th those levies are paid when the mayor Australian mayor return or Australian declaration goes to the stud book, and the stud book administers the levy for our program, which means there's one collection point for this levy, which is particularly efficient when you look at how it happens in other industries, which might be related to productivity of um, the amount of rice, tons of rice that you produce from various different producers, or in lots of other industries, it's a much more complicated process. We're very fortunate that we have one site of collection being the stud book, because it reduces the costs associated with that enormously. And then the good thing to understand about this levy is that for pretty much um, we receive dollar for dollar matching from the federal government, more or less. It's not quite dollar for dollar, but basically for every dollar we spend, we will get about 70 cents from federal government matching. So when we invest in research, development or extension, I thought it was really interesting the comment about adoption because that's what we're all about. If we're not actually getting the research that's done in the, silo, in the siloed world of research translated across to actually making meaningful change, then we're probably you know, not doing anything particularly useful. And I think that's what a lot of different sectors are grappling with. How do we get all of these incredible bright minds doing all this research? Something like, take something like 17 years for every bit of medical research to translate into something useful. That's a pretty horrifying statistic in a world where we are changing so incredibly quickly. We've got information overload, we're getting stuff thrown at us from, for, from everywhere, and we need to respond quickly. If the traditional manner of actually getting research to translate is taking 17 years, that's a hell of a long time to wait in a really fast changing world. So, the thing that's really important about this levy is that basically it's, it's matched funding. We pretty much double the money that you put in to be able, from the federal government, uh, to be able to double how much is available. So just quickly, who is on the panel? The, the panel started out um, in 2017 and I was on that initiating panel as well as uh, it was chaired at that point by Nigel Perkins, who's a, a University of Queensland professor who's an incredibly practical sort of guy and did a lot of research with probably a lot of you know him about the EAFL work that was done in the Hunter Valley. So he started out as the chair and I took on the chair role um, in the middle of last year when Nigel retired from the, from the panel. He'd done five years and the other person who, ha who has just left the panel who has been on since, since inception is Derek Field from Widden Stud. So Derek's been incredibly good at keeping the panel absolutely to task and making sure that we are investing in uh, industry 
relatable issues, as well as our involvement with all the major stakeholders. So we're very much aware that this money has to be going to things that are going to be effective for industry and that actually um, are relevant to your day to day pretty much. There are a few issues that the industry is facing which we are looking at as well, which you might not be quite so aware of in your day-to-day -day issues, day-to-day -day business. And those sorts of issues are around anthelmintic and antimicrobial resistance, so the resistance of antibiotics, which is developing at rapid pace. So we have been investing in those sorts of things as well, which are not necessarily, people are not necessarily as aware of in their day-to-day -day life, but certainly becoming more apparent across all sorts of, you know, for, for humans and animals alike, basically. So the advisory panel currently is me, Michael Grieve from Queensland, Mike Becker down in Victoria, Craig Sewan, who was a regulatory vet in Sydney for many years, Jacqueline Stewart, who's the keeper of the stud book, and the new two members who have just come on are Fiona Lacey from WA and Wendy Perriam, who's over in the audience, from here in Scone, and Guy Lester, who's an academic from... Um, the University of Murdoch as well. So we have um, breeders on the front line as well as people bringing a regulatory perspective, people bringing an academic perspective because when you're working with researchers you've got to have some industry of each of the different perspectives. So we have certainly in the past maintained a really good balance on the panel and that is going to be my aim as chair is to maintain a balance of people who actually bring all those different perspectives but can cross across and understand what the industry needs and, um, and make sure we're not getting bogged down in, in, in researching stuff, but more importantly, extending and adopting, getting, getting that research extended and adopted so that it, it um, makes change on the ground. Um, so we are an advisory panel. AgriFutures actually are the organisation that invests the money. We, there's not many circumstances where AgriFutures don't act on our advice, but that is a possibility, although it's never really happened. We literally sit down in a room and we put out open calls for research development and extension and we, um, we thrash out, you know, what the budget looks like. Just so, to give you an idea of what money is generated from the levy, we ten, tend to end up with around about a um, million dollars or so annually available for investment once matched. So it's 450 or 500 or so. The levy is very stable because the production of foals is not tanking. It's slowly over the last 20 years been doing this, but there's about 12,000 foals a year get generated um, in the thoroughbred industry, which means that us as an industry have a really stable levy, which makes us able to invest out to a number of years, which is very different to many other industries which have a whole lot of other variables that come in around production and the volume of production, which is what the levy tends to be um, based on. So we advise on applications for research, development and extension, and we ex we're also assisting industry in all of the in initiatives that they... Mm -hmm. There we are all the initiatives that they, um, hang on, let me just find this, sorry about that. They, um, we basically support industry initiatives which are already up and going. Certainly AgriFutures have been involved in many of the things that you would be aware of as pieces of research that have happened, such as the TORG report, so the welfare report. The, um, we support places in fast track. We certainly have tried to expand that, the interstate placements with fast track. Um, we are supporting the TBA education learning platform as well. So there's a lot of AgriFutures money which has been invested in stuff that you are probably quite aware of as stakeholders, but maybe not aware of where that's been funded through. So certainly um, we are very involved in, in um, working with stakeholders in the industry to make sure that what's getting supported is relevant for industry. We uh, monitor progress of all of those sorts of investments and we are regularly consulting with and reporting to industry stakeholder organisations. So the four priorities of the program are thoroughbred horse welfare, workplace and workforce safety and environmental sustainability as the first one, thoroughbred breeding, workforce industry and community engagement, and thoroughbred diseases and parasites. And this is our research plan for 2022 out to 27. So the 2017 to 22 plan, we had a lot more focus on um, sort of disease, in, disease research and looking at diagnostics and those sorts of things. So we have already devoted quite a lot of funding to that sort of area. 
it's very clear that we need a focus on horse and human welfare to maintain our social licence, which is probably the biggest issue we have as an industry, and that's not um, lost on us as a panel at all. So those are the four priorities from 2022 to 27, and we have allocated budgets. The plan is available on the AgriFutures website, and um, you can go there and have, and have a read of it. There's also research snapshots up the back which give you an idea of the projects that we've already completed and the ones that we um, are going forward with. So I think we've completed something like 24 projects already and have 23 on the go at the moment. Those ranged from economic um, impact of the industry around horse demographics, so what happens to a foal from when it's born up to racing and racing to retirement. Those sorts of metrics we had no numbers around at the beginning of this program, so we needed to actually find that information out to be able to combat some of the negative um, press that we've been getting. So we are currently looking at, we have done some stakeholder analysis around how people want to receive their information from um, various uh, parts of the industry. And mostly we came, what came out of that engagement was that pretty much people want to get their information from already established sources that they utilise. So they don't want another platform that they have to go to. And I think this is really inter interesting when we're looking at how many platforms there are for this, for that, for the other. People are not going to necessarily engage with AgriFutures website and things as such, but they want to be able to have this information fed through all of the regular media outlets or however they're getting their information um, already. And the real challenge in that is that we are an industry that has 70, 80 year olds, and we're an industry that we're trying to get a whole lot more 18 year olds. And that there's a real diversity in what people want within an industry like that. And I think that's a real challenge for us. How do we actually keep people engaged so that the rapid pace of development and change and technology isn't just scaring too many people where they just go, no, I can't, can't deal with this. At the same time as encouraging young people who obviously want all of that engagement. And I think that's probably one of our biggest challenges. How do you take everybody on that journey without scaring the pants off some and making others think that you're so slow that you're boring them to snores? So, you know, we, we, ha we certainly understand the challenges. We're looking at, at the best ways and we want your feedback on this. Um, we've done a lot of... Uh, Projects already, as I say, 24. We're currently looking at yearling radiography lesions impacting racing performance as one of the big projects, along with some endoscopy work, looking at yearling endoscopies as well. So we're looking at all sorts of really interesting and relevant um, re research that is relevant to you. The yearling radiography stuff, I think there's some stuff come out of the States last week around various um, impacts of various lesions. It's an area that we understand is of concern for all parts of the um, sectors of the industry and it's something that we've got a large uh, database of information There's something like 8,000 or 9,000 sets of radiographs which have been reviewed in this work. So that's where data is valuable, you know. Um, it's great to see that we're actually being able to get those sorts of information out of sales companies and, and utilise it for good. We're working on an early detection of pregnancy test as well and looking at the immune rec recognition of pregnancy. So these are some of the really important things that we've been doing and we're also giving a lot of industry support to support to initiatives that are already ongoing like Fast Track and all of those sorts of things, TBA learning. So we're very keen to hear from you and we want to know what your priorities are. We want to make sure that we continue engaging with you as a panel. Um, I'm here, Wendy's here. We, um, a lot of us know, a lot, we know a lot of you and we certainly want to make sure that you feel comfortable in coming to us with issues or with things that you really want to see investigating. Our program manager is the most positive person on the planet and you will um, enjoy engaging with her. Her name is Annalise McGaw and if you have things that you want to talk to about the, the panel or the program, um, feel free to get in touch, except that I think she's on the Cook Islands for the next week. But that's it. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much for that, Catherine. Um, I hope that gave you some insight into where and how our industry funds and levies are generated. And I've spoken to Catherine, I've spoken to Annalisa, and I agree, she is a, an amazingly positive person. And your last slide about communication, I think, you know, Annalise, when I spoke to her, she was 
fascinated to learn two ways what was going on. Equally, I was saying, Annalise, I've got no idea what's going on in the tremendous work you're doing. And I had to be careful because I didn't want to undermine the amount of research that the industry is doing and what Catherine touched on cannot be questioned. I, disease, fertility, all those components, I'm not here to, like, that has to continue and even increase. But if I'm going to be really honest, and I had this conversation with Annalise, is I didn't see one line, one, re one even reference to innovation. And this goes back to a problem that we've got everything, in my mind, and this is my personal opinion, we've got it slightly skewed the wrong way. At the moment, that funding is going all towards you know, research and science-based activities. I would love to see a little proportion of that even if it meant that Levy went from, for something controversial, went to 10 to $12 now that I've proved to you what we could do with those extra $2 if it all just went into innovation and improvement of our data services. But I think <clears throat> we need to question what do we need to be able to give the people that you've heard from today the confidence to continue to try and do the right thing by giving you the tools on the ground that make a difference tomorrow. And as Catherine referenced, some of the amazing research and stuff that's coming out of the, of the labs takes 17 years to come to fruition. Now that'll probably be fast tracked with AI. But what about creating some efficiencies that can be used on the farm tomorrow that start addressing those welfare concerns? And again, I refer to, we're in a massive advantage because we've already got them identified. But when I look on the TWR website, and it hasn't been updated since 2019, I don't think we're really taking it seriously and we can't afford to wait. We can make change tomorrow because we've got all the tools all sitting here ready to go, champion at the bit, because we all want the collective good. And we want to improve things. We've got the skill sets, we've got the technology and we can start it. We don't have to wait. So that's just another thought are we, you know, should we revisit that model? I mean, the $10 can't be questioned, it's doing amazing things, but is that going to be able to, if we don't create the avenues to bring in further employment or engage people into the industry, all that research is going to mean bugger all because we're not going to have an industry. It's a very simplistic way to look at it, but I think we have to balance that out a little more. Um, that's enough from me, certainly, but thank you very much, Catherine. I think we can all collectively, you know, take learnings from AgriFutures and open that dialogue. I think that's the best, best way forward. So thank you again for your time. Um, thank you, we'll wrap it up. Um, I'm so grateful for everyone's presence and engagement. I don't know how we're gonna make a massive difference tomorrow, but this is the first step forward. And again, sounds like an AA clinic. And all I can say is, and I thought about this, how do we collectively build momentum from today? And I tapped into a uh, Facebook site um, called Equi Innovation. Um, it's a Facebook group. Please go on there. It'll come up on the screen if, you, if I didn't get to use my clicker again. Here it is here. Ask questions. Let's just keep throwing, bouncing stuff off. Let's see what sort of momentum we can harness. And I'll flick this around. And it's just a great spot to ask questions. And I'll, I'll even link in Neil. We can ask for stupid things for, you know, where can Google help? What can we do to help Matt? You know, where are we going to be in five years' time to create those uh, efficiencies that we've talked about? Um, and I've written down here just a couple of notes that I hope that you all leave, leave here with a different outlook on change. In my opinion, it's not so much about how much or how quickly you embrace change. It's more about the awareness of the dire consequences if we don't evolve or we don't start to prepare for it. And I hope that we've started that journey here today for you. So thank you again. And I can't tell you how happy I am and thrilled. And thank you again to all our presenters. But um, thank you again for all your time and energy. Cheers. Bye. Um, on that, we'll be hosting a dinner at the Belmore. Neil will be holding charge. If anyone would like, he thinks he's interesting now, wait till he has a couple of schooners at seven o'clock tonight. He'd be um, more than happy to 
uh, join us. Are there any other questions someone would like to throw um, about that we've raised from today? We can go back to Neil, we can go to... Oh, it's my pleasure. I hope it's the first of many that we can do and you guys can spread the news in coffee rooms, have a bit more understanding and next time we do it, you know, invite someone else, tell them to come along and that's the only way that we're going to do it. And I, and I please, I'm so sorry if I've isolated individual organisations or put pressure, you know, undermined what people are trying to do. There's, everyone's under pressure in those organisations and I sympathise, but we just can't stand still and use that as an excuse. We've got to try and do something about it. And again, um, it'll benefit everyone. And if, it, if we don't change, it's, you know, you've seen this with the AI example, it's going to go straight past. And I use a really boring analogy that I know I'm involved in a dairy farm. I can tell more about a $400 Friesian cow every day, twice a day, than I can a $400,000 yearling in the paddock. Dairy farmers are equally time poor and half the resources that we do with this industry. So if they can do it, we can do it. So anyway, thank you. And um, till next time, really appreciate it.